Hello everybody and welcome to the Serial Killer Iceberg. Now, as many of you probably know, this video is a compilation of an older series from my channel. As a matter of fact, I began this series when I had less than 300,000 subscribers and was still shooting my videos on an iPhone camera. So needless to say, the series is a bit rough. Uh, the reason that I wanted to make this video is because for one, it's the only series over like three episodes that I haven't made into a compilation and I know a lot of you guys enjoy that because I'm able to cut out the intros, outros, ads, and whatnot. And also like part four or five of this series got age restricted at some point, so a lot of people didn't see it, what have you. Uh, so I wanted to put it all together, but the reason that I was hesitant to do it at first is because the quality of the content is not up to the standard that I want my content to be at now. But then while watching it back and thinking about putting together this compilation, it seemed like a nice little walk down memory lane. Uh, because sure, I wouldn't make that kind of thing now, or at least at that quality level, uh, but I am proud of where I came from and I'm proud to where I'm at now. So hopefully to those of you who have been with the channel for a while, it can be a sort of nostalgic trip. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the older videos like the Serial Killer Iceberg, then maybe it can be a cool reminder of how far I've come, so to speak. Now, that being said, serial killers are something that I'm hesitant to cover on this channel uh, because frankly, I don't like them. Uh, <laughs> I don't like glorifying people who have done horrific and terrible things. And uh, it, I rewatching the series, I don't think in confidence that I did that. I think that I demonize them in a way that they deserve. Uh, and I don't want what I'm doing here to be misconstrued as glorifying the actions of these terrible people because at the end of the day, they're just terrible people. Uh, so with that in mind, hopefully you guys enjoy. The iceberg begins with a lot of commonly known killers, but by the end gets a lot to disturbing individuals that you've probably never heard of. So for the first few tiers of this iceberg, I give kind of brief overviews as to what the killers do, but by the end, I spend entire chapters of videos delving into the individuals in question. A few things about this iceberg that I want to get out of the way really quick. For one, it was emailed to me back when I made this original series by a user named Nero Hito. So credit where it's due, it's all their creation. Thank you very much for that. Secondly, this iceberg contains several unknown spree killings. So basically, murder victims or suspected murderers that have never been caught or identified. But because the purpose of this video is to look at the psychology and life of certain serial killers, then the unsolved killings don't really match. So I've taken those out, even though you may see them on the icebergs. The only ones that I'm talking about in this video are the known killers. And then finally, between the time that I made this series and this compilation, there's been several changes to a lot of things that I mentioned in this series. For example, I talk about hearings that are coming up, or I talk about prisoners being in jail that have since either died or been let go, or the hearings happened, or what have you. So I'm going to be making a pinned comment in the, in the comments of this video sometime after this upload comes out, where I talk about some of the changes that have happened from what I mentioned then, so be on the lookout for that. So hopefully you like this video for whatever it's worth. I'm recovering from a bit of an illness and I'm not ready to record a full video at this point, but I've got a lot of cool videos coming on the way very soon and wanted to give you all something for the holiday season. Other than all of that, the only thing I can think to mention is as you saw in the intro, the U2's vinyl figure and coffee mug are available for a very limited time. I think this point it's like less than 10 days before they're gone forever so if you're interested in either of these head to that link in the description and pick them up while you can and thank you so much for the support that you all have already shown it means the world so check these out in the description if you're interested and other than that i hope that you enjoyed the video so we're going to go ahead and get into it before that i just want to say thank you for watching Tier 1 is mostly your more well-known serial killers. However, like I said, I'm going to try to keep it fun. Jeffrey Dahmer, also known as the Milwaukee Cannibal, was responsible for the murder and cannibalization of 17 men and boys between 1978 and 1991. Basically, what Dahmer would do is he would convince young men to come into his apartment on either the promise of drinks and relaxation or to take nude photographs of them. During this time, he would kill them 
at which point he would systematically dismember the body and eat some parts while using the others for decoration. He was eventually caught when one of his victims managed to get out of the room and inform police. When the police arrived to see if Dahmer had in fact assaulted this man, they saw the scene in the apartment itself. The first thing that tipped him off was in the corner of his bedroom with several large barrels that smelled awful. And when looking in one of Dahmer's drawers, they found several pictures of the mutilations he had committed. Then, when opening up the refrigerator, there were two preserved heads of his previous victims just setting in the fridge. While searching the apartment, they came across four heads, seven skulls, two hearts, several pieces of muscle, male genitalia, and those barrels that I mentioned earlier were vats of acid he was using to decompose the remains he didn't want. Dahmer confessed to pretty much everything and described in detail his motives and reason for it. He liked the idea of the bodies being around him and said they gave him a comfort and had plans to take the skulls as well as several other bones and construct a sort of arrangement in his apartment that he just thought would be kind of neat. One of the more gruesome details is most often while he was torturing his victims, he would do these sick experiments to them. For example, he would trepanate the skull of several victims before pouring in things like boiling water and acid just to see what would happen. He said his goal in this was to create a sort of zombie partner that would never leave him and be by his side. But that obviously didn't work, so he just stuck with the bodies. And in 1994, Jeffrey Dahmer was beat to death in prison by a fellow inmate. Charles Manson was the leader of the Manson family, named for obvious reasons, and in 1969 the cult committed the nine Hollywood murders. Charles Manson poised himself above this group of free thinkers that very much so followed the hippie role model idea, and began to tell his followers teachings of a coming apocalypse. He said that this apocalypse would be spurred by a race war that would happen between the white and black population of the United States. So in order to be ahead of the curve, he had his cult kill several high profile actors in Hollywood, and then attempt to blame it on the black community, which he then thought would start the inevitable race war. He called this whole thing the Helter Skelter plan, and figured himself a sort of messiah figure to him and his people. The most famous of these murders was Sharon Tate, in which four people broke into the Tate residence and killed four people, including Sharon Tate, her previous ex-fiance, as well as the heiress to the Folgers' coffee fortune. Eventually, everyone was arrested and sent to jail, with Manson himself dying of natural causes while in prison in 2017. John Wayne Gacy is the famous killer clown that killed 33 boys from 1972 to 1978. See, John Wayne Gacy had the side gig of dressing up as either Patches or Pogo the Clown and performing at things like kids' birthday parties. While on the side, he was abducting young boys, taking them back to his home in which he would abuse them in various ways before murdering them and burying the majority under his floorboards. See, 33 boys comes from the number of bodies that they found. It's estimated that he potentially killed a whole lot more. However, John Wayne Gacy wasn't exactly the talkative type or very remorseful of his actions. As a matter of fact, when executed by lethal injection in 1994, his final words were, and I quote, kiss my ass. To give you an idea of how hated he was in the community, while he was being executed, there was a crowd outside who were having essentially a party and cheering that the clown is finally dead. Jack the Ripper is the name given to the perpetrator of the unknown murders that occurred in the Whitechapel district of London in 1888. Five women are confirmed to be the victims of this Jack the Ripper, although it's believed by some that there could be more. And while the area of Whitechapel is confirmed, and while there are five known victims who were all sex workers at the time, little to no headway in the killer's identity has ever been made. Several of these killings had dissections performed, which leads some to believe that perhaps the person that did it was a surgeon or a medical professional of some sort, while some point out the fact that Jack the Ripper was very intimate with the knowledge of police presence in the city and managed to both murder victims in places they wouldn't be found and then leaving letters in places he knew the police would find them. So the theories of this go everywhere from surgeon to cop. Sadly, this this killer will probably never be found out, as the majority of the evidence that was amassed against him was destroyed during the Blitz of London. But I mean, you probably don't have to worry about it. It was like over a hundred years ago. There's no way the dude's still around unless he was a vampire. Ted Bundy is believed to have murdered at least 30 women during the 1970s. Ted Bundy is the quintessential example for not everyone who looks friendly is trustworthy. As a matter of fact, the majority of the ways that Ted Bundy would perform his murders was by either enticing women to follow him or 
disguising himself as a police officer or some other authority figure in order to get a victim alone. Normally this resulted in him taking young women out to deserted areas, killing them before performing things on their body. The trial was a sort of circus show with Ted Bundy playing his own lawyer and being very bombastic during the whole thing. Which during one of the trial phases he escaped or tried to. He was gone for a few days, broke into someone's house, stole a gun, and then got rearrested. So yeah, I'm sure he's totally innocent after that. It's believed by many that the main motive for these murders was a sort of sexual deviance. At a young age, Ted Bundy had mentioned that he came across several pornographic novels to which he got very interested in them and then was always seeking the next thrill higher. Which even then, it's a really big jump from like, you know, like dirty magazines to stabbing people. He was found guilty and executed by the electric chair in 1989. Son of Sam is the nickname given to David Richard Berkowitz. He was caught in 1977 after murdering eight people by shooting. After being arrested, he said that his neighbor had a dog named Sam that was a demon telling him to commit these murders, and went on this whole tirade that Sam would talk to him and tell him what to do and how to do it. Although later, after being convicted and in jail for a while, he said that the whole thing was a hoax to try to get an insanity plea. In one of the letters he left for police early on in the killings, he said that he himself is the son of Sam. Before this, he was simply called the 44 Magnum Killer because that's what all the murders occurred with. In the years since, David's kind of settled down and has said that his actual killings were because he was part of a satanic cult that had killed many more people throughout the country that the authorities just simply didn't know about. And David Berkowitz is still alive in prison to this day. The Zodiac Killer is the name given to the person who killed several people in California from the 1960s to the 1970s. The name comes from the fact that after every murder, the Zodiac Killer would leave a cryptic message that was hidden in a sort of code that the authorities and newspapers would attempt to figure out. He even claimed that in one of these was his true name. The majority of the murders consisted of the Zodiac Killer finding young couples at date locations such as overlooks or a lakeside shore to which he would then murder them before sending a letter to the newspaper and police afterwards. Now if you're familiar with the Zodiac case you'll know that there was a certain author by the name of Graysmith who became obsessed with everything the Zodiac killer did. According to him who is quite possibly more close to the case than anyone the perpetrator was a man named Arthur Lee Allen. Arthur Lee Allen was one of the initial suspects but was cleared of one of the early murders because he had an alibi. However according to Graysmith it was absolutely him and while not making any accusations because haha this is all jokes and just theoretical a lot of the evidence does support that theory including the fact that shortly after Arthur Lee Allen's death there were no more Zodiac killings. Richard Ramirez, who is more popularly known as the Night Stalker, was convicted of 13 counts of murder as well as several of sexual assault and breaking and entering. As a kid, Richard had an abusive home life to which he would regularly sneak out and sleep in a local cemetery. Several contribute this to part of the reason that his later fascination with death and the occult came to be. As he got older, he got very into drugs such as LSD and exploring concepts like Satanism. He then began a spree of attacking and then murdering women before he was caught. Several of the jurors were afraid of him because while on trial he showed no remorse or fall for his actions. And as a matter of fact, after one of the early days of the trial, one of the jurors was found dead in their home, to which all of the other jurors thought somehow the Night Stalker managed to get loose or orchestrate a way to kill the other juror, to which they were all then afraid to return to trial. It turns out that that juror died by a totally unrelated murder, but it goes to highlight the fact that everyone thought he somehow did it because that was the kind of intensity he gave off. His final words to the press were, see you in Disneyland, to give you an idea of his attitude through this whole thing. And also, he was engaged twice while in prison, one of which he was actually married to before she was divorced after figuring out that one of his victims was only nine years old. In 2013, Richard died of complications due to lymphoma while awaiting the death penalty. We are now on to tier two, which is going to be talking a bit more about the lesser known. Henry Lee Lucas was convicted of killing 11 people from 1960 to 1983. Henry definitely had a hard home life growing up. His father was a raging alcoholic and his mother was a sex worker who would normally take Henry cross-dress him, and then essentially pimp him out to passerbys. I'm not one to be like, oh, well, this poor person, they did the things that they did later because of what happened to them, but 
But in cases like this, um, y you know, that probably had something to do with it. And it definitely had something to do with the fact that in 1960, Henry murdered his mother, which he was arrested and charged with second degree murder. Although he was released after only 10 years due to prison overcrowding, which... Are you sure there wasn't like anyone less dangerous than the guy who murdered his mom? Like I'm sure there was at least one dude in the prison for like an alcohol violation <laughs> who they could have let go instead of this guy, but I digress. After that point, he was in and out of prison a lot for things like theft, as well as killing several people during this time. But what he is most famous for is for the over 100 confessions he made. Now you may be thinking, wow, he must have murdered a lot more people, um, but hold on a second. So you gotta realize he was already serving a life sentence, and there were a lot of inconsistencies in his stories. Like for example, he'd look at the evidence and then they'd be like, you did this? He'd be like, yeah, I did it. And they'd be like, what with? And he's like, um, what weapon did you say was used again? And it wasn't until later the police started to think about it because every time he'd come in for a confession, they would like serve him steak and give him all this free time to like walk around outside and think about what he's done. Uh, that they were like, you know, <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't, like, give this guy a vacation every time he confesses to something. Because, yeah, it got to the point where, like, once a week, he's like, I am ready to confess another murder. And then he'd get, like, a five-star meal and then go back to his cell. And then next week, I'm ready to confess to another murder. So, you know, because of Henry, they stopped doing that, and he died of natural causes while in prison in 2001. Albert Fish, who went by the names of the Werewolf of Wisteria, the Moon Maniac, and the Boogeyman. This is, like, side tangent. I can't stand the fact that serial killers are always given the coolest names. Like, there's the whole argument to be made about, like, glorifying criminals, and I understand that, but maybe, like, the first step could just be, like, don't call them stuff like Jack the Ripper and the Moon Maniac. Maybe if we call these guys stuff like Stupid Baby Man, then no one would want to do any more killings. <laughs> That's my uh, political stance that I'm running for office with. Uh, stupid Baby Man, yes. It's like the opposite problem with hurricanes. Because like, no one runs away from hurricanes, they just like stay in the area. It's like, yeah, because you named them stuff like Irene and like, Buford. Like, no one's gonna run hiding from a storm named Gary, but if we called it something like the automated wood chipper death machine 9000, people might leave. Okay, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, Albert. At the end, Albert Fish admitted to three murders, although the estimated number is more in the hundreds. Albert's gotta be one of the most evil people who ever lived. He would commit these acts by finding children that he thought wouldn't be missed by society, which in the 1930s most often consisted of immigrants and minorities, to which he would take them to his house and perform acts of assault, dismemberment, torture before finally killing them and disposing of their bodies. He also practiced very extreme forms of self-affliction, such as stabbing and crushing his genitals as well as inserting glass objects and anyway. The reason he only admitted to the three in the end is because those are the ones that he was being charged with. Although it didn't really matter in the 1930s because one or 1,000 you're gonna get killed for it either way. During his trial they listed the number of sexual disorders he had and it's like a page including really gross stuff like necrophilia as you can imagine as well as like coprophagia and urophagia and um other things. To give you an idea of how hated this guy was, they deemed him insane but should still be put to death. <laughs> to which he was, in 1936 he was executed by the electric chair, but shortly before his execution he had written a letter that morning that he wanted read to the press, to which his lawyer took one look at it and destroyed it saying it was the most senseless and absurd string of obscenities that he had ever read. The Boston Strangler, later ID'd as Albert DeSalvo, murdered 13 women during the 1960s. What's interesting about the Boston Stranglers to this day, many people believe there to be more than one killer. See, the reason for this is right before he was caught, he broke into a woman's house, which was the standard way that he would go about his murders, to which when the woman awoke, he stopped, said, I'm sorry, and left. So DeSalvo was arrested for this, 
and when interrogated confessed to being asked if he was responsible for the Boston Stranglings. But because of the manner in which he was arrested and people saying the police did not handle the evidence properly, a lot of people believe that perhaps he was pressured into confessing for the murders of someone else. And in 1973, he was stabbed to death in the infirmary of the prison by a fellow inmate who's never been identified. In recent years, however, due to advancements in DNA testing, the 13th victim had DNA of her killer on them them, to which that DNA proved to match that of DeSalvo. So he was at least responsible for the 13th murder, but people think that may not mean he was responsible for all of them, so who knows. The Snowtown murders were committed by John Bunting, Robert Wagner, and James Velasquez from 1992 to 1999. After being caught, initially they all testified that they were hunting down pedophiles, and that the people they were murdering had got away from the justice system and they didn't want them to hurt any further children. However, after that, it then devolved into like, well, we also killed, like, you know, the homosexuals and other people that we don't agree with. And then it eventually just got to, like, well, we killed the weak, which, okay. And in this righteous crusade of theirs, they did things like steal the people's money and personal identity, like their social security cards, which... <laughs> whatever. Once the bodies of their victims were found in various barrels and they were all convicted of the crimes, they were all given life sentences. Ed Kemper, also known as the co-ed killer, was convicted in 1973 for murdering 10 people, including his own mother and grandparents. See, when he was 15 years old, he murdered his grandmother while his grandfather was out with a shotgun, later saying that he did it just to see what it would feel like. He then was afraid of his grandfather's reaction, so whenever his grandfather came back home, he murdered him too. Somehow, he was released only six years later because they didn't think he was a threat to society, which, yeah, that totally didn't backfire. Kemper was also a master manipulator. As a matter of fact, he tested with an IQ of 145 stood at six foot nine and was known to be able to talk his way into anything. The majority of his murders worked by picking up hitchhiking women, to which he would then take them somewhere secluded, murder them, dismember them, take them back to his house, and use the pieces for things. Kemper was eventually caught and given life for all of these murders, but what's wild in reading about him is everyone's like, Oh, well, you know, Ed Kemper, he's like a really changed guy now, and he's really reformed, and he says things like, oh, I understand the terrible things I've done, and everyone's okay with him, when we know for a fact he's a super smart master manipulator, and everywhere you read on him, they're like, he's a, he's a different man now, and he's eligible for parole somehow, and in 2024 is going up for parole again, which... No, <laughs> don't, don't let that guy out. Peter Sutcliffe, also known as the Yorkshire Ripper, there we go with the cool names again, murdered 13 women between 1975 and 1980. The majority of his killings were that of sex workers, which he said he was told by God to cleanse them from the earth. However, he was also like hooking up with them, so like, is, is that really why you're doing it? Uh, are they really that awful? Okay. And interestingly, the thing that got him caught was he was pulled over for having an expired license plate. And Peter died last year of COVID while in prison. Aileen Warnos killed seven men from 1989 to 1990. Aileen worked as a sex worker and she would be picked up by men on the road to which she would then shoot them before going away and then starting the process over. She had sort of a rough history leading up to the actual murders. Like for example, she had already been in jail for armed robbery and was in several vehicle accidents and just proved to be all around reckless. During her trial, she argued that every single one of these circumstances was self-defense. Initially, she said that all of the men attempt to sexually assault her, but then she changed it and said one of them sexually assaulted her and she was just kind of afraid that the others would. But she also hid the bodies by dumping them off the sides of roads to which they were found later and she never came to the police saying that she was assaulted, so... You can't, like, go to trial for a bunch of murders and then be like, oh, those were all defense. I just forgot to call. Whoops. She was executed on October 9th of 2002, and her last words, which I have to read off to you, were, I would just like to say I'm sailing with the rock and I'll be back like Independence Day with Jesus, June the 6th, like the movie. Big mothership and all. I'll be back. I'll be back. So, <laughs> take that what you will that's 
it's something all right. The DC sniper was responsible for 10 murders in 2002. It turned out later that the DC sniper was actually two people, those two people being John Allen Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo, aged 41 and 17 respectively. What not a lot of people know is that this pair had actually killed an additional seven people before the DC shootings ever took place. They essentially had a crime spree driving through the South in which they would rob someone, shoot them and take their stuff, which left a lot of people dead as well as a lot severely injured. The actual DC shootings himself consisted of the pair making a makeshift sniper hide out of their vehicle to which they would park it in DC populated areas take a shot before driving away and doing the same thing somewhere else. During the investigation, authorities were baffled that someone could shoot a gun in the middle of the city and no one see them, and that's why the car makes sense. Because all it consisted of was them pulling up, firing out the back in a makeshift hole that they had drilled underneath the license plate, before getting away. The way that they were finally caught is in one of the many phone calls that John Muhammad had with the police, he bragged about getting away with murders previously in the South, to which the police then figured out about one of the seven murders I mentioned earlier, and then linked that to John Muhammad and eventually found them, to which they were then arrested inside the vehicle itself. After Muhammad was sentenced to death, Malvo came forward and began to give details of why they did it. Muhammad was in the military and grew very anti-American sentiments. His plan was a three-phase operation. In the first phase, they would kill 10 white people a day every day for 30 days, which he figured would cause, you know, a general level of upsetness in the city, before the pair would make their way to Canada, stopping at orphanages and adopting young boys, to which he would then train for years in explosives and shooting and all kinds of boy scout techniques, to which he would then send each of them into major cities to carry out their own attacks and eventually tear apart the United States. Muhammad was executed in 2009 and Malvo is still in prison to this day. Ed Gein, also known as the Plainfield Ghoul, which Again, cool name. While many believe him to be a serial killer, was only ever convicted of one murder. Gein is famous for making the skin suits as well as the human furniture that most people know him for, although not a lot know his reasoning. Gein was always very close to his mother, and after she died, he sort of spiraled into insanity. He began to dig up bodies that he said looked like his mother and construct different things out of them. The most famous of which being his attempts at a skin suit, which he said he wanted to look like his mother's skin so he could crawl inside of her, which meh. And then the parts that he couldn't use for the suit he made into lampshades, a belt, furniture, and all kinds of weird stuff. The one murder that he committed was whenever he went to a hardware store and the owner, he said, looked like his mom. So he ordered a delivery to have her come to her house, to which when she came, he killed her. This immediately resulted in his capture because all the police did was go, oh, this is the last place she went, okay. And when they drove there, he had her strung up, decapitated, and skinned, preparing to fashion her. He confessed to an additional killing, although confessions in the 1950s were weird and it was never proven if he did or not, but either way he died in prison in 1984. Fred and Rose West are responsible for the murder of 12 women from 1967 to 1987. Fred and Rose, by every account, seem to be extreme sexual deviants. The two of them owned an inn in which they would regularly hook up with guests. Not only that, but Rose worked as a sex worker in the inn to which Fred would enjoy the view, and the particularly horrible part about it is the abuse that their children eventually suffered. This would normally consist of Fred abusing his daughters, to which Rose would then say, well, you were asking for it. Fred's daughter of a previous marriage began to become weary of what their parents were doing, to which one night they murdered her. Their other children didn't know about this, as they said that she simply got a job in a city and had to move away, but they would regularly say things like, don't act up, or else you'll end up under the garden like your sister. And once that information slipped to people at the school and eventually the authorities, a whole investigation was made in which eventually Fred confessed but said Rose had nothing to do with it, and they found a ton of the bodies in the flower bed. Throughout the trial and everything that followed, Rose completely maintained innocence while Fred tried to take the fall for her. Although all accounts that were given didn't make sense, Rose had to be involved in some sort. And miraculously, despite Fred's efforts, 
During the trials when they first saw each other, Rose kept pushing him away because her strategy was to make it seem like she was disgusted with her husband. This made Fred depressed, who then said she was responsible for a lot of it before he hanged himself in his cell in 1995. Rose to this day is still in prison, where she maintains that she is innocent of the charges against her. H.H. H. Holmes confessed to 27 murders between 1891 to 1894. He was only ever convicted of one though because, like I described earlier, they hang you either way, to which the majority of these murders occurred in something famously known as the Murder Castle. H.H. H. Holmes was rather rich and built this multi-purpose structure that was both apartment complexes as well as a shopping center underneath. However, after his murders came to light, inspection of these apartment rooms was, um, interesting. To give you just a few things, there were several false hallways that had no end and worked as a sort of maze through the rooms. There were several soundproof rooms made to mask victim screaming, as well as hinged walls that allowed access to one room from a secret doorway in another room, and several chutes that led directly to the basement, which in the basement was a crematorium as well as several vats of acid that he used to dispose of the bodies. It was for this reason that there were never any bodies recovered from the hotel, and people simply like checked in and then went missing, which eventually the police got suspicious of, and he probably would have gotten away with it a lot longer, but then for some reason he felt the need to murder the children of his third wife away from the hotel. He did this by putting them in a trunk and suffocating them, and then simply throwing the trunk underneath a rental property, to which, you know, someone smelled it and complained, and then the police found it, to which then he was arrested for it, and initially said that the devil made him do it, but then he said he wasn't the devil, and then he said it was the devil again, and his stories kept changing. Either way, he was hanged in 1896, but what's interesting is that in recent years, people began to believe that perhaps he used his immense wealth to escape death, and several said that he simply had an empty casket buried. So, in 2017, they dug up his body to show everyone that the body's still there before reburying it. What's especially ironic about this is one of his requests at his death was to build a large cement wall around his coffin as he was afraid grave robbers would come and steal his body. Which no grave robbers did, but he was re-exhumed because people thought that he didn't actually die. And as for the murder castle itself, it burned down in 1895. So you can't go look at it, but what's interesting is that several people say they saw two men ignite the fires, and there was this whole legend that it was Holmes and the devil coming to get rid of their handiwork. Ivan Malott, also known as the Backpack Murderer, killed seven people from 1989 to 1993. The reason for the name is that he would often pick up hitchhikers and people who seemed to be traveling on the road before driving them to a secluded spot in which he would strangle them. One of these people fought back and managed to get away and picked up by someone else to which he then informed the police. The police managed to ID the vehicle as one that was recently sold because Malat was trying to get rid of evidence fast, to which Malat was eventually arrested and tried for all the murders. A lot of the things he did in prison afterwards are just weird. Like at his first day in prison, he was almost beaten to death by another inmate. And in 2009, he cut off his pinky finger to try to mail it into the Court of Appeals in Australia because he thought that would make them sympathetic, but whenever he goes to mail it, they were like, you, you can't do that. And then he was upset that he wasn't given a PlayStation in his cell, so he tried to starve himself to death in protest, which lasted like a week, and Milat eventually died in jail in 2019 of natural causes. We are now on to Tier 3, which going into this iceberg, I had never heard of any of these before, which is why research for these takes especially long so I can only imagine what the other parts will be, but let's get into it. Brady and Henley refers to Ian Brady and Myra Henley, who were responsible for murdering five children from 1963 to 1965. They're also commonly known as the Moore's murderers. Reading about their life, there was a certain wickedness that the two of them had while together. They both fantasized over stories of prisoner torture, as well as researching things like nihilism and developing this whole idea that life is meaningless, but death isn't. Normally the way they would go about their murders is Myra would pick up young girls either walking to or from school, 
or just out and about and offer to give them a ride. She would then normally tell a story that if the young girl could help, she needs help finding an expensive ring that she lost in the moors. After which point Ian would be there and he would attack the girl and brutalize her before murdering her. And they were eventually outed after being witnessed by Brady's brother-in-law. The two of them were given life sentences and Brady died in 2002 while Ian died in 2017 of natural causes. Andre Shikatal, Shikatil, Shik, Shik, it's Russian, um, sh shit, Shikatilo? Andre Shikatilo, it's what I'm going with. Also known as the Red Ripper, which, it's such a cool name, they don't have to give it to such a loser, anyway. Was convicted of killing 52 people from 1978 to 1990. At a young age, Andre was diagnosed with chronic impotence. He became incredibly depressed because of this, especially in high school, in which he didn't feel like he was worthy of courting any of the girls he was interested in. However, he finished for the first time in his life after wrestling a young girl. So Andre figured that the only way that he could achieve that was by attacking women. He eventually moved out of his hometown, and this is before any of the murders occurred, after having several breakups because he couldn't physically satisfy anyone he was with. However, he was kicked out of the school after he assaulted one girl in a pool and another in his classroom, both of which times he successfully did the deed after which point he began to spiral and seeing that he has nothing left began to just attack random women either they be homeless or women just taking the bus or women who seem to be alone he would attack them and kill them in order to get yeah this occurred after one night he was wearing a disguise and pulled a woman to the side to experience it and then as she tried to fight him he stabbed her to which he realized oh that also does it for some reason he was sentenced to death and executed in 1994 which the only like funny thing out of this entire circumstance is the means of execution was a gunshot to the back of the head which eastern europe is absolutely wild for that it wasn't like a firing squad it wasn't like some huge formal thing they put him in a soundproof room with one guy who had a gun and just shot him in the back of the head and like i'm not trying to make light of death or anything but could you imagine like you know you're cuffed you're going to the death room essentially and then the door opens and it's just like some dude in a t-shirt with a revolver like hey you come here often? Dennis Nilsson is responsible for the Muswell Hill murders, which was 12 people that died from 1978 to 1983. Dennis had a hard home life growing up and the only person that he was really close to was his younger sister. After getting a little bit older, Dennis realized that he was homosexual. However, he tried to talk himself out of it and say that he was only attracted to certain boys who had characteristics similar to that of his sister. So in order to alleviate this, he assaulted his younger sister. However, he still had the feelings afterwards because, duh, and he simply remained closeted. He joined the military and seemed to adapt well for a while. That was until one night when him and a friend got drunk and passed out, to which he woke up and saw his friend lying there unconscious and got overwhelmed. He didn't do anything at the time, but that began to be a fantasy that played over in his head. And not only being the person who would commit the act, but to also be the victim, as several times he would pretend to be unconscious in revealing positions, hoping that someone would do something to him. It, it's so gross. After he got out of the military, he tried to begin legitimate relationships while out of the closet. However, none of them seemed to work out. It was during this frustration that he realized the ultimate form of his fantasy was a body. So as soon as he got someone else to stay over at his house, he murdered them, to which he then kept their body for some time. And you know the rest. As mentioned earlier, he did this with 12 different men, and the thing that got him put away was a clogged drain. See, after these bodies got to a point that he couldn't use them anymore, he would chop up most of the pieces and bury them, but some of them he would flush down the drain. This eventually resulted in a clogged drain to which a plumber came and looked at it, and after opening it, found human hair and other remains, to which the plumber freaked out and says, this looks like human skin. To which Dennis replied with, I guess someone flushed their fried chicken. <laughs> the plumber took a sample 
informed the police, who then came and arrested Dennis, to which he confessed to everything. He was given a life sentence and died of natural causes in 2018. The Grim Sleeper, whose real name is Lonnie David Franklin Jr., is responsible for 10 murders that occurred between 1985 and 2007. Lonnie was dishonorably discharged from the military when he sexually assaulted a young girl while stationed in Germany. The murders themselves of the Grim Sleeper came from him sexually assaulting women before killing them. The reason he got the name the Grim Sleeper is because there was a 14 year gap in the murders. It's believed it's because he had a kid during that time and possibly for a while put away the murderous side, but then it came back. And that son ended up being the thing that put him away. They had a positive DNA match from one of the victims that occurred in the 80s, however, there were no matches for it. So fast forward way later to 2007, when they did another test on it, just to see if something turned up, and Lonnie's son turned up as being a close enough match. The reason was Lonnie's son had DNA in the system after he was arrested for a weapons charge. Of course, that wouldn't make sense for his son to be the killer because he wasn't even alive when the early ones happened. However, it may mean that his dad did. And sure enough, whenever they went to investigate, they found hundreds of tapes and images that he had taken of his victims, which, you know, is a pretty good sign he did it. And the Grim Sleeper died of natural causes last year while in prison. Stephen Port was given a life sentence in 2016 for four murders and a lot of sexual abuse. See, it's widely believed that Stephen never even meant to kill those four people. What Stephen would do is he would regularly go to bars in which he would drug men using a date rape drug and take them back to his house before doing the deed and then dropping them off somewhere. The four people who died were determined to have died from an overdose of this date rape drug. And it was apparent that Steven didn't really know what to do with the murders and kind of panicked after they happened. Like for example, the first one he dropped off on a street and then called the police saying that he saw someone pass out and they should probably do something about it. And then he dropped the others off by a church out in the countryside which the same woman found the two bodies on two separate occasions while walking their dog, which begs the question, how many dead bodies do you have to find on the same road before you walk your dog another direction? And the last one he wrote a fake suicide note for, so the kind of sporadic actions afterwards implies that he didn't really mean to kill him. Still totally responsible, but does it mean that that was his first option? And because of this, he was given the name of the Grinder Killer, which is so much more fitting than the other ones. Like, imagine if a guy murdered a bunch of people and then they called him like the Tinder Bender. Like, that's so ridiculous. And they should be made fun of, so why not make fun of them? I don't know why we don't do that more often. Also, before any of this came to life, Stephen Port was on an episode of MasterChef, which... I couldn't not mention. Dean Coral is responsible for killing 28 boys from 1970 to 1973. These murders were known as the Houston Mass Murders. Coral had two accomplices, which were each teenage boys. Coral would pay the boys $200 each to drive around, try to find some teenage boy by themselves, and either say that they were going to go get high or go to a party or just give the kid a ride, to which the kid would then get in the vehicle, they would drive to Coral's house, and that's where Coral would do the deeds. Normally what would happen is Coral would get the boys very drunk, to which he would then take the victim and tie them up before abusing them over the course of several days before shooting them and disposing of the body. However, the story of how Coral got brought down is very interesting. So one of those accomplices, a boy named Henley, had his friend with him who Coral had said can just come over to drink and smoke because there was a sort of weird friendship between them and that Coral wouldn't kill his friend. However, before leaving Henley's house, he heard commotion from his neighbor's house, and it turns out his neighbor, a young girl about his age, was being attacked by her alcoholic father, to which Henley said, why don't you just come hang out with us? After showing up, Coral was immediately outraged by the fact that Henley had brought a girl, saying that he ruined everything. Coral eventually got over it, and after getting really high, they all passed out, and whenever Henley woke up, he was being tied up like the other victims of Coral. Henley convinced Coral not to kill him, 
and instead said that he'll help him do the murders of these two others. To which Henley then took an opportune moment, stole the gun away, and shot Coral to death. However, despite being responsible for Coral's death, Henley as well as the other accomplice were still responsible for kidnapping a ton of boys and even possibly assisting with the murders and torture. So they were each given life sentences to which the other accomplice died last year due to COVID and Henley is still serving his life sentence. Now what's especially interesting or should I say terrifying about Coral is that he told the two young boys that he was part of a national group that trades around young boys. And when going through the pictures that Coral had, there were several boys seen in the images that were not found among the bodies, implying that there were many more victims. Because remember, Coral's dead now, so the only ones who said what actually happened were the two boys as well as the evidence of the bodies they found. So those extra pictures implies that there were many more victims, quite possibly of a much bigger scheme. Gary Ridgway, also known as the Green River Killer, was responsible for 49 murders between the 1980s and 1990s. Ridgway was weird from the get-go. Like when he was 16 years old, he stabbed a six-year-old child in an attempt to murder him and never got punished for it. And growing up, he became a sort of sex addict who was also really interested in the Bible. So he would talk about things like the love of God and then proceed to have these intense fantasies to do with random women. See, Ridgway was married to several women who demanded that they have that several times a day. Not only that, but in public and revealing places. So what Ridgway would do is he would get sex workers to fulfill these fantasies, to which in an intense moment of post-nut clarity, he would think about how much he hates sex workers and then kill them. Most often ditching the bodies at the same place that he committed the crime. And in places where it wasn't necessarily public, like a forest, he would return days after to continue acts. He was eventually convicted using DNA evidence, and what's interesting is that during his interviews he confessed to 71 murders. Although there were so many he couldn't remember where all the bodies were and evidence wasn't found, so they eventually just stuck with the 49. Although like I said it's quite possible that there were many more. And he's still serving his life sentence to this day. Richard Chase, known as the Vampire of Sacramento, anyway, was convicted of six murders in 1978. So Richard was a very weird kid and he was an extreme hypochondriac. At a young age, he would do things like hold oranges above his head to say he's absorbing the vitamin C that's going through them. He said that his skull was broken into pieces and moving around, so he began to shave his head so he could watch what his skull does, as well as making the claim that someone stole his pulmonary artery. So, yeah. He eventually moved out of the house with his mother because he thought his mother was trying to poison him. And then he moved in with several roommates who complained that he would do things like walk around the house completely naked. And after asking him to move out, he wouldn't, so they all moved out. It was around this time that he began to pick up random stray animals before killing and eating them raw, saying it kept his heart from shrinking. He was eventually brought into a mental hospital after he went to a normal hospital because he injected rabbit blood into his veins. After giving the guy a ton of anti-schizophrenic drugs, they said that he wasn't a threat to society and just sent him out the door. To which he was found a few months later on a native reservation, just in the middle of the woods, smeared in blood with a bucket of cow's blood in his car. And he was given no penalties for this. You can just get a bunch of cow blood, rub it on yourself, run around a reservation and it's a Friday night. All the murders occurred in the span of a month when he would break into people's houses and then murder them before eating pieces of them saying it's making him stronger. He would also drink the blood from the people that he killed, hence the name the Vampire of Sacramento. And, and this isn't funny, but it's kind of funny. So one of the things he said after he was caught is that if he approached someone's house and the door was locked, that he wouldn't try to break in because that meant he wasn't wanted. But if it was unlocked, then that was a sign to come in. It hints, again, the whole vampire thing. But one of the houses that was unlocked, he walked into, no one was home. So for some reason, he walked into the child's room, pooped on their bed, and just left. <laughs> Why did he do that? And I know he's like insane and like had serious disorders but like what what part of his whole health plan does just like 
dumping on someone's bed personify. And could you see being the family? Like, you come back home, nothing's stolen, nothing's taken, but just on your daughter's bed. <laughs> anyway, while in prison, he constantly said that he was afraid of the Nazis and the aliens coming to get him. And in, in one interview with a newscaster, <laughs> Midway through, he just started pulling handfuls of macaroni out of his pockets. <laughs> because he said that the guards were Nazis who were poisoning him. So, just middle of a conversation, holding eye contact, just tries to hand the reporter a bunch of macaroni. He then stocked up a bunch of his schizophrenic medication and then took it all at once and overdosed in 1981. The Hillside Stranglers was the duo of Kenneth Bianchi and Angelo Buno. They killed 10 girls from 1977 to 1978. It seems to me like their original plan was just to commit one murder, but then they got a taste for it. The reason was the two of them decided to start being pimps and when one of the girls ended up backing out on them, they got very mad and ended up killing the person who suggested that girl to them. And after that's when the cycle began of killing women and violating their bodies, so it seems that the two just enjoyed it. Some of these were very sporadic too. For example, Bianchi ran an upholstery shop to which a girl came in to talk about business. She was the last one there, so his cousin pulled him aside for a second, they had a conversation, and then just killed her. Buno died of a heart attack a few years ago, but Bianchi is still in life in prison at this day. I have to mention that Bianchi's girlfriend, while he was in prison, tried to strangle another girl to death to make it look like the police got the wrong guy. The way they were going to do this was Bianchi gave his girlfriend a used condom and she was going to plant the evidence on the victim that she killed so that the police would see the DNA and think that the guy in jail was framed for it, which... Okay, which say what you want, but that is loyalty right there. Carl Pinzarm was convicted of killing five people, although the actual number is expected to be well over a hundred. And he also claimed to have sodomized thousands of young boys. And yes, that's 1,000 with an S. At a young age, it seemed that Carl was abused in the training school that he went to, to which he burned it down. And throughout the 1920s, went on a spree of kidnapping young boys, sodomizing them, murdering them, and then ditching them. He is only convicted for five because that's the five the police knew of that they approached him with. But again, back in the 20s and 30s, one or a thousand is the same penalty. After going to prison, he told one of the guards that the first person that gives me trouble is gonna die. To which, sure enough, one of the foremen gave him a hard time, so he beat him to death in the prison. For that murder, he was sentenced to death in 1930 and while on death row, one of the guards bought him a cigarette. Carl was so amazed by this act of kindness that he asked for a pen and paper and he wrote down everything. This is where the claims of the over a thousand sodomizations come from. During his execution in which he was hanged, he spit on the executioner's face while he was putting the black bag over his head. And when asked if he had any last words, he said, Yes, hurry it up, you Hoosier bastard. I could have killed a dozen men while you were screwing around. So. If you can't say anything else about him, at least he was consistent. Clifford Olson, also known as the Beast of British Columbia, which, there we go with the cool names again, was convicted of the murder of 11 children in the early 1980s. The way he went about most of these killings is he would catch the children either while they were on their own or abduct them from a crowd, to which he would strangle them and then leave their body in a secretive location. He was eventually caught by the police in which he made a really weird deal to give up the locations of the bodies of the kids he killed. Clifford made a deal with the Canadian police that he would be given 10,000 Canadian dollars for every body that he shows them. That money would be deposited into a pension fund that would go to his wife and at the time infant son, saying that even though he doesn't care about these children that he murdered, he did however care about his wife and kid. And for some reason the police agreed to that deal and ended up giving his wife and son 100,000 Canadian dollars for the 10 bodies that Clifford showed them, although he threw in an 11th one which he said was a freebie. The public wasn't made initially aware of that deal until the trial, to which people were then outraged that the person who killed their children was given $10,000 for showing the police where the body was. Despite this, nothing changed in the agreement, and Clifford was given a life sentence. But due to the way Canadian law worked at the time, Clifford was eligible for parole after 25 years, so the judge said at the sentencing hearing 
hearing of the trial that Clifford should never ever under any circumstances be let out. Of course, Clifford still tried for parole, and in his 2006 parole hearing, he said that he should be let go because he gave the United States a warning about 9-11 and that they had granted him clemency for it. Which let me remind you, for one, Clifford was being jailed in Canada, and two, no he didn't. You gotta think about it. this is five years after 9-11, and at his parole hearing in which he's supposed to convince a group of people that he is not crazy or a threat to society, he tells them that the United States freed him because he warned them about 9-11. Of course he wasn't let out for that, but that wasn't the end of his weird prison controversy. After this news got to the public that Clifford had been drawing on essentially a social security system in Canada that applies to people over the age of 65, and that he was basically getting his retirement fund deposited into an account that he could access if he ever got out. So keep in mind, this is the second time that Clifford has got a lot of money from the Canadian government while either on trial or in jail for murdering children. And at this point, the account had been going for several years, so the dude had like 30 grand if he ever got out. But this time, the authorities actually looked into it and was like, hey, we should probably do something, and killed the account. And despite all these shenanigans, Clifford died of natural causes while in prison in 2011. Leonard Lake is responsible for 11 to 25 killings of women at a remote cabin in California during the mid 80s. As a child, Leonard was raised by his grandmother, who had interesting ways of encouraging his behavior. For example, when he was young, he would begin to do things like photograph pictures of the female members of his family while they were naked, like in the shower or something rather, and his grandmother found out about it and encouraged it, apparently, saying it was some artistic expression or whatever. And then he started doing things like melting rats in acid, to which again, his grandma was like, oh, kids and their hobbies. And this steadily building mean streak kept getting bigger and his grandma kept not doing anything about it. This came to a head when while in Vietnam during the war, he had a mental breakdown during a combat mission. For this, Leonard was discharged and sent back home to the US. It was around this time that Leonard got really into the hippie lifestyle and even married a hippie who then later divorced him whenever she found out that he was filming adult movies that she wasn't aware of. It was shortly after this that Leonard befriended another Vietnam vet by the name of Charles Nag to come live with him at this remote cabin in the middle of the woods. It was during this time that Leonard and Charles would get together, kidnap women, bring them in, torture them, do explicit things to them before murdering them, all while recording it similar to the adult films that Leonard used to make. We'll talk in a second about how they got rid of the bodies and all of that, but they probably would have gotten away with it a lot longer if it hadn't been for a really stupid move that Charles made. See, Charles had a track record beforehand of being a petty thief. He would just go to stores and randomly steal stuff. One day, Charles was in a hardware store in which he stole a vice, for some reason, and then left. Charles told Leonard, who said, well, you know, we don't wanna hurt the economy or whatever, so Leonard went back to the hardware store to pay for the vice. By the time Leonard got there, the police were there taking up a report from the person behind the counter, so Leonard walks in and says, hey, it was my buddy who stole the vice, let me just pay for it. The police, immediately suspicious, asked for his ID, to which Leonard handed them the ID of one of his murder victims. See, the way that Leonard and Charles would do it is they would catch whole families at a time, murder all of the men, and normally just keep the woman alive for torture, so they had all of these trophies they had accumulated over time. So when Leonard hand the officer a picture of a man who, upon search, had been reported missing for a while, they go outside and take a look in Leonard's car, and sitting in the passenger seat is a pistol with an illegal suppressor on the end of it. So that's odd, so they brought Leonard in for questioning. As soon as he got brought in for questioning, he popped four cyanide pills that he had hidden in his jacket and killed himself there in the interrogation room. Or at least he seized up and went comatose. Technically he died four days later, but same difference. Which imagine being the police in this situation. You get a call that a vice has been stolen, so you go there and the guy's like, hey, it was my buddy, let me pay for it. So they're like, why don't you come down to the station 
and he just kills himself. <laughs> this gave the police ample opportunity to go back and search his property, and when they did, they arrested Charles, who found the full display of what they had been doing. Constructed next to the cabin was a structure that the investigators later called a dungeon that was full of various restraints and torture devices and looked like something out of a horror movie. It was there while searching the property that they figured out that the way the two of them would get rid of their victims is by melting their bodies in acid. Remember how earlier when he was a kid, he would do the same thing to rats well now he does that but to like you know people what couldn't be melted was then compiled up and then buried around the property itself which the police began to find while also searching the property they found something that was labeled a treasure map which while following it they managed to find several barrels that were full of personal effects clothing ids and stuff like that as well as in these barrels they found several videos of the two of them committing these crimes. That's the reason that the murders are 11 to 25, because while yes, they found remains of at least 11 different people on the property, they found personal belongings and identification of much more. Interestingly, Charles Lawyer during the trial didn't ask any questions to the witnesses that came forward and seemingly just threw the case. Now, I can't prove this at all, but my own theory is that it specifically says that he began to stop asking questions and all that after the evidence was brought forward, or in other words, the tapes. So perhaps this lawyer was looking to defend Charles until he saw videos of him torturing and brutalizing these women, and from the logs of what was said in the videos, it was pretty brutal. That maybe the lawyer just decided he didn't want to save this guy's life and just let the case carry on. Either way, to this day, Charles is still in prison on death row. Gilbert Paul Jordan, known as the Boozing Barber, which that one's like on the line of goofy and cool, so I'll let it slide, is responsible for the alcohol murders. While it's believed that he killed between eight to 10 women, he has only ever been convicted of one charge of manslaughter. The reason being his murder weapon, as the name suggests, was alcohol. The way he would do this is he would get women to come over to his apartment, most often sex workers, to which he would then pay them to see how much they could drink. Whenever the women inevitably passed out, he would then tilt their head back and pour alcohol down their throats until they died of alcohol poisoning. And that's the reason that even though he murdered like eight to 10 people, they could only ever get him on one charge of manslaughter because it's really hard to prove that, you know, he did that rather than just he was hooking up with someone and they drank too much. Even though while apparent and looking at the evidence, it's very clear he killed these people, especially given the number of people that it happened to, it's hard from like a legal standpoint to say either, oh, you killed this person or, oh, they accidentally killed themselves. Also, the drinking was not exclusive to his victims. It is reported that this guy drank 50 ounces of vodka every day and somehow didn't die of alcohol poisoning himself. After like the eighth death, it became apparent to the police what he was doing. So they started listening in at his house to which he could be heard telling the women, oh, I'll give you $50 if you drink that bottle, but a hundred if you can drink both of them. Actually, I'll just make it 200 if you can drink that and so on and so on. Which for these poor women who most of the time were in a struggling spot anyway in order to make money, this was an offer they couldn't pass up but sadly led to their end. But as mentioned, they only ever got him on one manslaughter charge to which he served nine years before being released. And then almost as soon as he was released, he got arrested for being at a bar and trying to force alcohol on a woman. To which he pretty much gets a warning gets back out, and then at a hotel party, almost kills a woman, but her friend managed to get into the room and save her as he was pouring alcohol down her throat, to which he was only given 15 months for like reckless endangerment. So he gets out and then gets in trouble for doing the exact same thing again and gets off with no penalty. I have no idea how you can look at someone who has definitely done it eight to 10 times, tried to do it two more times each after getting arrested, and then now you're sitting there on the third time and you're like, you know what? I think he's innocent. <laughs> However, he eventually died in 2006 of guess what? You guessed it, alcohol poisoning. It's pretty pathetic that like such a sicko, despite everyone on this list, who like showed proof that if given the chance they would do it again, 
got the lightest sentencing, like nine years and then the 15 months and released three times between them and he never got any better. So thanks justice system, rehabilitation, cool. Robert Picton was convicted in 2007 of the second degree murder of six women, although that probably isn't even close to how many he actually killed. The police initially wanted to charge him with another 20 and then to an undercover agent who was in jail with Picton, Picton said that he had killed 49 and wanted to kill one more woman to make it an even 50. At a young age, Robert Picton lived with his family on a family run pig farm. Something that is too weird to not mention is one of the reasons he later said was the cause for his crimes is that at a young age, he really fell in love with like this baby calf and he just had a connection to it. And then, you know, it's a slaughterhouse farm. So one day the calf gets slaughtered and that just like flipped a switch in his mind, which I don't necessarily think if a kid loses their pet, they just automatically become a serial killer, but whatever his word. When Robert's parents died, the control of the pig farm fell on him and his brother, but his brother really didn't want anything to do with the slaughterhouse pig side of it, so Robert picked it up and lived on a trailer on the property. Deciding to update it a bit, Robert converted the barn into a sort of bar strip club area that was known as the Piggy Palace Good Time Society. It was a popular place for raves and strip shows at the time and was commonly visited by the Hells Angels. However, it was during one of these parties that he stabbed one of the strippers to which she took the knife and stabbed him back and they both ended up going to the same hospital. The woman who had a handcuff around her wrist said that it had been Picton who handcuffed her and then tried to stab her to which she managed to wrestle the weapon away and stab him, pointed out that the key to her handcuff was in Picton's pocket to which when the people at the hospital checked it was and they managed to unlock her. However, he never saw trial for this because no attorney thought that her story would stand up because she tested positive for several drugs and she was a less than desirable candidate. I don't know, you know how the law works. So he pretty much got off of the situation scot-free. However, there was a local police officer who noticed that several of the women who worked on the corners or sex workers who would normally come and talk to him throughout the day began to disappear. He started to think something was weird about this, so he asked one who said that the most recent missing person had went to go check out the old pig place. To which it turned out that several of these women who Picton had picked up to bring back to his property had just disappeared. Given that and the previous stabbing history, the police launched an investigation to which they found several personal effects of those women who went missing on his property. However, his argument was, yeah, they came over, maybe they dropped a card or a purse or whatever. I don't know, stop bothering me. And they can never get anything conclusive because they were never able to find any body parts. To which the absolutely horrifying idea came forward that perhaps because it's a pig farm and perhaps because he ships out meat that he's either using the bodies as food for the pigs or even worse food that he's shipping out. This was such a concern that a notice went out to several of the pork markets in the area to check their meat concentration because it uh, may not be pork. Eventually, the police managed to obtain enough of a warrant that they were able to search his actual trailer, to which they found several of the bloody clothes and effects of the women who went missing. And searching after that, they managed to find skulls and other various bones that were scattered around the property. Also inside the trailer, they found a lot of other weird things, like a bunch of syringes containing a little bit of a blue liquid in them, as well as a pistol that he had placed a rubber anatomical device, I think I'm safe on that one, on the end of it saying it worked as a makeshift suppressor. Another thing they found in the trailer was several videos of Robert with associates talking about what he does to these women, in which he mentioned things like one of the best ways to kill a drug addict is to fill a syringe full of windshield wiper fluid and then have them inject it in themselves thinking it's a drug and that will kill them, hence the blue liquid in the syringes that was found. As well as videos of him taking the bodies, cutting them up, 
and then feeding them to the pigs. See, for those that don't know, uh, pigs are all like cute and sweet whenever they're domesticated and around, but pigs in the wild are like really feral. And by really feral, I mean they're not only scavengers, but they'll rip bigger animals apart in groups and then eat them. So there's kind of a belief on pig farms that don't let them smell your blood or see your blood because they could go rabid at any second. So all Robert had to do was take these bodies cut them enough so they bleed, throw them to the pigs, and then throw away whatever they didn't eat. And to you right now who's watching this while eating spaghetti with marinara or meat sauce, uh, you're welcome for that visual. Thankfully, however, he had never sent the body parts off with the meat he was shipping out, so I guess that's one plus. And the reason he was only ever tried for six murders is because all the other murders and stuff around them, the initial 20 that the police wanted to charge him for, were circumstantial as there wasn't actually recorded evidence of their bodies and just some stuff found. And the judge knew that if you take it from six murders to 26 murders, there's more evidence of like a mistrial that could happen, or in other words, the defense could poke holes in more stories. And the judge w just wanted to stick to a solid six so they could lock this guy away for good. However, for some reason, maybe just a really good defense attorney or what, the jurors were like weirdly sympathetic for him. Like there was a bunch of stuff during the trial about, oh, how he couldn't have done that, which never heard that one before. Or like how he doesn't deserve all that, which like, it's, it's gotta be like one of the most brutal serial killers ever. But these people are just like, oh, well. I'm sure he didn't know what he was doing. There was even a point to which the jurors asked the judge if they could rule that he was guilty for it, but that he wasn't responsible for his actions. And not in like an insanity plea way, and like he didn't know what he was doing, like he's a child or something, I don't know. Which is the reason he was only ever eventually given the sentence of six second degree murders because the jury demanded that they take it from first degree murder down to second. But like, so second degree implies that it was a spur of the moment thing and you didn't like plan the killings in advance, but this dude literally had syringes full of the windshield wiper and he hid the bodies and had plans to get rid of them. Like it's as first degree as first degree can get. And even stupider, the sentence for six second degree murders is the same as the sentence for six first degree murders. So he still got life in prison with a chance of parole in 25 years, which he would have got, it, it's so dumb. Either way, Picton is currently serving a life sentence to which he will be first eligible for parole in 2032. So fingers crossed that those jurors are not on the parole board. Wayne Williams was convicted of the murder of two men in 1981, however, as we're going to talk about in a second, it's possible that the actual murders were up to like 30. See, Wayne Williams was a sort of disc jockey on the radio and had ambitions of being a pop music producer. Around this time, something was going on called the Atlanta Child Murders, in which in the city of Atlanta, there were several children being murdered and their bodies found several days later. And since several of the bodies were found around the same location floating down the river in Atlanta, it was believed that it was all done by one killer. One morning, the police were scoping out a bridge where it was believed the bodies were being disposed of, to which while sitting there, they heard a loud splash, implying that something had just been thrown from the bridge above. The police then race over to the end of the bridge to which the only one on it at the time was Wayne Williams. They pulled him over, asked what he was doing at this hour, to which he said he was driving across town to meet a young woman who was about to become a famous singer. He gave them a name and a phone number, which both later turned out to be fake. And sure enough, two days later, they found a body that had sank underwater right at the spot that Wayne had thrown it over, or supposedly Wayne had thrown it over. Because of this, Wayne was brought in, to which he failed three polygraph tests, and his DNA was found on the body of not only that one victim that fell in the water, but another one who had been recently killed that still had DNA remains on him. Not only that, but after Wayne was arrested, the serial killing spree of the Atlanta child murders stopped all at once. And then while at trial, while being questioned on why he did the crimes and 
being attacked by the prosecution, he got incredibly angry and started yelling and screaming, which supposedly, you know, turned the jury against him. To which he said during the trial that he was being framed by the Atlanta police for a killing that was actually being committed by the Ku Klux Klan. And while several people came forward in years since saying there's no way he could have done it, most of the arguments come down to, well, he was a good guy, so it's impossible that he could have done it, which you know how that goes. So why am I not saying definitively that Wayne killed these people? Well, that's because while there is a lot of evidence showing that he did, there's just enough for my conspiracy theorist mind to not 100% just say, yeah, this is the dude that did it. The main reason for that is a guy by the name of Charles Sanders. See, Charles Sanders was a chief KKK member who was also being investigated for the child murders around the same time. However, of course, whenever they found Wayne and all this happened, they let Charles go. And at the same time, Charles had passed all his polygraph tests. But even though Wayne failed his and Charles passed his, polygraphs aren't 100% perfect and there's a lot that go into them. So it's not like conclusive. And the Atlanta child murders themselves were happening to young black children in Atlanta which on Wayne's side was seen as just victims of opportunity, but to a KKK leader obviously has racial implications. Also, one of the main things that ended up convicting Wayne is that several of the other victims that were found had traces of not only his DNA, like the two I mentioned before, but traces of his dog's DNA, as well as DNA from his carpet. But because the DNA was so degraded at the point it was retrieved, it's not a 100% exact match, instead it's like a 80% match. Like for example, whenever they pulled the DNA from the other people and said it matched Wayne's, it actually was like down to a percentile of black men who may be living in Atlanta or it could be someone else. And also the dog hair samples that supposedly matched Wayne's dog that was found on the victims actually just kind of matched that breed of dog. And Charles Sanders supposedly said Thank God we have the same kind of dog and carpet, implying that he is responsible for several of the murders. But that statement itself came from a reporter and it's like third hand information at this point. So there's no way to verify it and it, it's really messy. It's so messy as a matter of fact that last year the Atlanta police announced that they are going to retest Wayne's DNA against the DNA found just to be double sure. Because at this point, like one of the investigators said, it's like 98% sure that Wayne was the killer. However, they want to be 100% sure. And to give you an idea of how convoluted it is, one leading theory is that Wayne committed like half of the Atlanta child murders and either Sanders or someone else committed the other half. Like I said, really murky waters. Herbert Mullen confessed to killing 13 people in the 1970s for some interesting reasons. Herbert was pretty normal growing up and through high school. However, the first signs that something was off was shortly after he graduated high school, one of his close friends died in a car accident to which Herbert then made a shrine of his friend in his house. He then got this overwhelming fear that he was homosexual because it was the 1960s and that kind of thing was frowned upon. So he let his family place him in a mental institution, although he left shortly afterwards. Shortly after leaving, he did things like beginning to burn himself with cigarettes and he tried to become a priest for a while and then got kicked out of an apartment he was living in because he would be up all night screaming at people who weren't there. And investigators later said that he was suffering from paranoid schizophrenia, which yeah, probably. That also wasn't helped by the fact that he was known to smoke weed and take LSD all the time, which I'm sure just made his schizophrenia super fun. It was around this time that voices in his head began to tell him that he had to begin performing human sacrifices to stop earthquakes from hitting the California area. This was around the end of the war in Vietnam, so he said that Vietnam was doing enough of the killing for now but as soon as the war's over, he needs to start doing the job himself. He killed the first of his victims after he pulled his vehicle on the side of the road and asked a homeless man to come take a look at the engine. While he was looking at the engine, he said he could hear the homeless man speaking into his mind that the homeless man was Jonah from the Bible 
and that it was now time to sacrifice him to stop the earthquakes. So Herbert pulled out a baseball bat and beat the man to death on the side of the road. He then murdered a woman before feeling guilty about it and going to a priest to confess his sins. However, in the confessional booth, as he was confessing, he believed that the priest wanted to be the next sacrifice, so he got out of his booth, walked over to the priest, stabbed him to death, and then left. Also, the police were none the wiser to this because, like, for example, someone saw him running away after stabbing the police, so they just thought that it was a robber for some reason. And shortly after this, Herbert tried to join the Marines so that he could kill more. However, he wasn't allowed to because he failed the drug test. Because he failed his drug test and therefore couldn't do as much killing as he wanted to, he saw that drugs were the reason that he wasn't going to be able to stop the earthquakes. And so he needs to get back at the person who introduced him to drugs. So he decided to track down his high school dealer who first sold him marijuana. He went to the house where the dealer used to live, asked the lady who was now living there where to find his address. She gave them the address. So then Herbert drove to the guy's new house, killed him and his wife, before driving back to the original house and murdering that woman and her children. This detail was very damning to him in court because the defense's argument was not guilty by reason of insanity, but the fact that he went back supposedly to cover up evidence that he was ever looking for the dealer in the first place gave the prosecution enough regard to say he was in charge of his actions. Look, he did this just to cover up evidence. Not long after this, he went to a state park to which there were four teenagers camping there illegally. He said he was a park ranger and that they had to leave. They laughed at him and he shot them all to death. Which, it's not funny, I'm not trying to make light of it, but imagine being one of those teens and the park ranger's like, hey, you gotta go, and you're like, no, and he just shoots you. <laughs> he was eventually caught while driving through a neighborhood. He saw a man mowing his lawn and just got out of the car, grabbed a rifle, shot him in the front yard with a ton of people watching, slowly got back in his car and just kept driving at a normal speed. And the police caught him like three minutes later to which he didn't even resist arrest and was just like, huh, I wonder how you got me. He was found guilty and confessed to the murders. And like I said earlier, didn't get away with insanity because he tried to cover up evidence. And one of the weirdest things to mention, while he was in jail, he had a cell for a long time right next to Ed Kemper, the co-ed killer, who is the really tall charismatic guy that I talked about in the first part of the serial killer iceberg. Ed said that in the early days of Herbert being there, he would keep singing all the time and it annoyed everyone. So he just started splashing water onto Herbert until he quit. And then after that, Ed began giving him peanuts for good behavior. And they kind of got along in that weird relationship, which I'm not trying to make light of like the horrible evil things these men did, but it's so weird to imagine two serial killers and one of them just feeding the other peanuts through the bars. And Herbert Mullen is still in jail to this day. Paul Bernardo is responsible for a lot of sexual crimes. However, has only ever been convicted of three murders that he committed with his wife, Carla Hamalka. At a young age, Paul's father was arrested for child molestation, which it's believed Paul kind of internalized and wanted to be like his dad. Not only this, but Paul began to hate his mother, saying that it was her fault that her dad turned to things. Paul also expressed a lot of dangerous signs at a young age. Like for example, when he was in high school and just out of high school, he was known to beat women that he would go out with. That was until he met Carla, who he began to beat and do those things to, and she really liked it. Not only did she like it, she vastly encouraged these violent sexual acts. Around the time he was beginning to know Carla, it's believed that he committed around 18 sexual assaults against women. And then after meeting Carla, it got a lot worse. That started with Tammy, who was Carla's sister. See, despite the fact that Paul and Carla were engaged at this point, Paul kept coming on to Tammy, again, Carla's sister, and Carla enjoyed it. So much so that she would do things like break Tammy's windows, that way Paul could like 
open them up and watch her sleep. And eventually, Carla began drugging Tammy so that Paul could have his way with her. However, Tammy continuously kept waking up during these events, which I'm not sure if Tammy would have been in a frame of mind to recognize what was going on, because even though she was conscious during points when she would sort of come on to Paul and Paul would make out with her whatever back and forth, it seems she wasn't aware of the extent that Paul was abusing her. This culminated one night in which Carla said for a Christmas gift to Paul, she had completely drugged Tammy so that he could do whatever he wanted. However, she used way too much and during the events that ensued, Tammy threw up and choked to death on her own vomit. Paul and Carla immediately cleaned up the scene, make it look like they were never there, and then called the police, to which when the police got there, they said that Tammy had drank so much that she passed out, and then subsequently threw up and suffocated. And I know this is really gross, but again, this is a serial killer iceberg, what did you expect? As soon as like they took away Tammy's body, Carla dressed up as Tammy and then continued the acts, which is so ugh. Eventually, Paul and Carla got married, to which for their wedding gift, Carla had picked up a 15-year-old girl who she had drugged as Paul's wedding gift. Now, like I said, they're responsible for the murders of three people, one of those being Tammy. However, it's thought that what happened most of the time is Carla would kidnap a girl who would be unconscious, Paul would do disgusting things, and then they would leave her somewhere to which she wake up and never be the wiser. Or in other words, it seems like the ones that actually died were more so accidents. And again, that doesn't relieve them of any of the consequences that they should face for these actions, just that they didn't mean to kill them because they didn't really know how to handle it afterwards. For example, whenever they were doing this to a 14-year-old girl who died during the process, they didn't know what to do, so he quickly ran to a local hardware store, bought a bunch of cement, and then dismembered her body, encased the pieces of her in these cement blocks, and then took them to the nearby coast to throw into the ocean. However, one of these cement blocks that he had built was way too big and weighed like 200 pounds, so he just kind of sloppily rolled it out of the back of the car, to which later a fisherman saw it, thought it was weird, called the police, they cracked it open and found a body part, and then they looked and found the other body parts, to which they actually ID'd the girl who was murdered by her orthodontist equipment. Around this time, police began to get suspicious of the couple because they were reported like taking pictures of girls as they were leaving school, or just being really creepy to like teenage girls out at restaurants and stuff in the area. However, they can never get something conclusive enough to stick, that is until one day, they kidnapped a 15 year old girl in the middle of the street as she was walking home from school with like a whole town watching. They did this by Paul walking up behind her with a knife and then Carla grabbing her hair and then dragging her into the car. People didn't immediately recognize the couple but it started this full scale manhunt where everyone was looking for the couple around this time. And just the next day, Carla went into work although she was covered in several bruises because the beating that Paul did wasn't exclusive to the victims, remember, Carla also enjoyed how he would do that to her and it's so awful. To which investigators around started to put together clues that they were looking for a young couple and then a young woman matching that description is beaten and bruised. So whenever she was eventually convinced to go to the hospital by her co-workers for the injuries on her, the police confronted her, said we know who you are, and she confessed. Now while it's not sure why she made this confession, and some people think maybe she had a change of heart, I disagree and I think she only did it because she realized the police are everywhere and they're probably not gonna get away with this for much longer. Also, Carla cut a deal that in exchange for her testimony against Paul, she would only receive 12 years in jail. Now I know that's like, nothing compared to what she deserved for the crimes that she committed, but also at the time, the prosecution team did not have evidence or any idea really of the extent that this couple went to, so the idea of the battered wife who was forced into this role made sense. However, as soon as the trial started, 
Turns out they had recorded all of these actions they committed against these girls as well as the murders and it was videos of Paul and Carla enjoying it during the whole thing. The prosecution then said at trial if they had seen these tapes before, they would never have cut the 12 year deal with Carla. Carla also said that the actual number of women that Paul assaulted either with or without her is closer to around 30. However, the information that Carla brought forward was enough to get Paul put in jail for life, and again, she served 12 years and then was released. Also have to mention this side note, Paul was absolutely obsessed with the book American Psycho, which was later made into a movie. So like during this whole thing, there was never any spirit of guilt or whatever. He thought that he was cool and suave for being able to attack and kill women in this way. He essentially thought of himself as some sort of renegade or cool guy who's just outside of the system. And I want to emphasize that for everyone out there as his next parole hearing is four days from the recording of this video or in other words, on June the 22nd of 2021. So let's hope that that doesn't happen <laughs> because after reading all the details and details of the murder and everything else that he did, I hope he rots. Samuel Little was an active serial killer for over 35 years leading up to his arrest in 2005. He confessed to a total of 93 murders with 60 of those murders being confirmed, which for those keeping score is the record in the United States. The majority of Samuel's crimes were sexually motivated. As a young boy, he said he developed an affinity for women's necks after while he was in kindergarten, he saw his teacher rub her neck one day and that just flipped a switch in his brain. And throughout his teen years, he began to collect true crime novels and books that had depictions of men strangling women. This started him down a violent path of assault that began to culminate into other crimes and eventually murder. By the time of his final arrest in 2005, Samuel had been arrested for DUI, fraud, shoplifting, solicitation, armed robbery, aggravated assault, rape, and of course, the murder. What was especially terrifying to me about Samuel is watching his tapes, he seems like one of the kindest people you'll ever meet. Of course, at the time of his arrest, he's a senior citizen, but every single interview he does, it feels like just a grandpa telling a story, and this is even something the interrogators mentioned. He would talk casually about what the weather was like, what he was doing that day, and the way any older relative would tell you a story about their childhood, and then he'll just throw in the detail of who he murdered and how he did it. Not only that, but he remembered very specific details about all of the women, all of the details of what they looked like, how they behaved, and where he eventually left the body. And like I said, it's doubly creepy because if you take his descriptions of these girls out of context and just play them as is, it sounds exactly like some veteran from the war talking about a woman he fell in love with overseas. Like there's this weird nostalgic reminiscence to it. And then you add on the last like minute where he's like, but yeah, I killed her and dumped her in the lake. But she was pretty. It's what makes cases like this particularly disturbing because it really highlights the whole it could be anyone ideology. Another detail about him is he was incredibly squeamish around the sight of blood, which is why all of the killings he did were strangulations, which also the whole neck thing I mentioned earlier. But he also did things like drowning and beating people to death. This is again because he was squeamish around the sight of blood, but it also turned out to be very beneficial to him down the line because he never really left a ton of DNA evidence and he time he killed somebody. In one story of a time that he was almost arrested and caught for the murders was whenever he had a dead body in his back seat uh, parked on the side of the road and a police car pulled up and as the cop was getting out of his car he climbed into the back seat and then came out the side door and started zipping up his pants to make it look like he was just with a woman. So whenever the cops there's a flashlight, he's like, whoa, whoa, what's going on? And Samuel says, oh, you know, me and my wife are just fooling around. So the cop walks up to the window, shines the light directly on the body, staring into the face of the woman in there. Samuel says, well, she may be a little drunk. And the cop says, all right, you kids get out of here. Which it's so harrowing to think that he was that close to getting stopped in the murder of his killing spree, but it just got away. By the time of his arrest, Samuel had served a total of 10 years in jail with over 100 arrests, even once being tried for a murder 
that it was later figured out he did commit, however he got off at that first trial. A.M. Samuel died of natural causes while in prison last year in 2020. Rodney Alcala, also known as the Dating Game Killer, which we'll explain the name in a second, committed at least seven murders from 1977 to 1979, although in my opinion, like we'll see, I think there were way more than that. Rodney's criminal record began when, while living in California, he had abducted and abused an eight-year-old girl. He did this by kidnapping her off the side of the road and bringing her to his apartment, which other kids saw and called the police. When the police got there, the eight-year-old girl was still alive, although very horribly abused, and little known at the time, Rodney had escaped to New York and changed his name. It was shortly after this that the FBI began putting out pictures of Rodney and even moved him to the top 10 most wanted list. During this time, Rodney had gotten a counseling job at a school in New Hampshire, until one day one of the students at the school saw the poster from the FBI recognized it as their counselor and had him arrested. It was found out years later that Rodney had actually committed a murder during that time that he was a counselor and living under an alias. After being extradited back to California, however, the eight-year-old girl's parents would not allow her to testify and relive the event, so Rodney pretty much got off with a basic assault charge. He served two years for that, got out of jail, almost immediately was arrested for assaulting a 13-year-old girl he gave a ride to school, went back to jail for only another two years, and then got out again. It was during this time that the crime spree started. What Rodney would do is he would approach these young boys and girls and tell them that he was a photographer. He would say he does several adult photo shoots and would have them pose provocatively so that he could take pictures of them. So provocatively, in fact, that the FBI has since posted the pictures so that people can identify missing loved ones. However, they have not posted 90% of them as, according to them, they are far too explicit. It's from these pictures and the bodies that were discovered later that the seven confirmed deaths came to be. However, in the literal thousands of pictures that Rodney had, there are several people who have never been identified and henceforth never found. So there's a solid chance a lot of people that he took these pictures of didn't make it. The reason he's referred to as the dating game killer is because at the height of his murder spree, he went on the game show called The Dating Game. In the show, several bachelors answer several questions about a bachelorette, and one of them gets to go on a date with her. Everyone was incredibly freaked out by Rodney, with another contestant saying he had some very weird opinions about things, which I can only imagine what that means. And Rodney won the episode, however, the girl would not go on a date with him him saying that he was far too creepy. The way he was finally caught is that shortly after one of the girls disappeared and then her body was found later, a man drew a sketch for police that very closely resembled Rodney. Rodney's parole officer recognized it, got warrants to search Rodney's stuff, and upon searching his apartment, found that woman's earrings. And then after he was arrested, a very stupid series of events happened with the trial. The first trial got thrown out because they said the witnesses weren't properly informed of previous crimes. The second trial was also thrown out because someone was hypnotized as one of the witnesses and that was considered faulty or whatever. So the third trial finally got started in 2010. And then, and I'm not kidding here, Rodney decided to be his own defense attorney and at one point called himself to the stand, so he interrogated himself as himself, being both the interrogator and the interrogatee, to which he referred to himself as Mr. Alcala and spoke in a deeper voice when being the attorney. So this guy, in trial for his own murder, literally stood up and went, Mr. Alcala, did you commit the murders? And then he would turn and go, no, I did not. Well, you are a very handsome man. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Alcala. You're welcome, Mr. Alcala. <laughs> to which his chief argument was that he didn't remember committing the murders, so therefore he couldn't have committed them. I should also mention that that specific interrogation portion went on for five hours. <laughs> and during the closing statements, Rodney simply played the entirety of the song Alice's Restaurant on a boombox, which is about the protagonist of the song wanting to kill someone. <laughs> which, I... 
I guess he saved money on the defense attorney, but you get what you pay for. A specifically damning piece of information that came during the trial is, remember that eight-year-old girl that started the whole crime spree? Well, she came back after 42 years to testify at this third and final trial. Rodney was given the death penalty and is still alive on death row to this day. Eric Edgar Cook was convicted of killing eight people from 1958 to 1963. Eric was born with a cleft lip, which he later got surgery to fix. However, he suffered from several more facial deformities as he aged due to severe injuries brought on by beatings and factory accidents. Despite being transferred to several different schools, he was constantly bullied for his appearance by several other students, and he also wasn't exactly the brightest from testimonies of those who knew him, and many believe that's what contributed to his main streak attitude. Starting off on a very high note, one of his first notable crimes is that when he was 17, Edgar burnt down a church he went to because they didn't let him join the choir. Despite this mean streak, Edgar married and ended up having seven kids with his wife, and at the same time sort of moonlit as a weird sort of random crime criminal. See, this was Australia in the late 50s, and apparently it was common for people to just leave their keys in their unlocked car. So Edgar would look around for cars at night, get in them, start them, go on his joy rides and then park them back and the owners were never the wiser to it. It was during these late night joy rides that his murders and other crimes took place. Pretty much he would just drive a random car around and then see a house he liked, run inside, steal a bunch of stuff and leave. Or just attack people on the side of the road or just get into traffic accidents or whatever, he was just a loser. The methods in which he killed his victims included choking, stabbing, shooting, and hitting them with a car. And because of the seemingly random acts of violence, which it pretty much was, it took a long time for police to connect that these were all the same people. Edgar would also do bizarre things, like for example, one time he murdered a woman in her house and then just spent hours sitting in the living room, drinking their lemonade, and just chilling out. And then another time he got really drunk and he dragged a woman that he had just killed into the neighbor's yard, assaulted her body, and just left it there. The way they eventually caught Edgar is after he had killed someone by shooting them, he had ditched the gun in a bush off the side of the road. The police, while investigating the murder, found the gun took it to a forensics lab, confirmed that it was in fact the gun, and then put it back in the bush with a string attached to it. So then the police just staked out the area for a couple days, and sure enough one night, Edgar comes back to get his gun, although because they tied it, it's tangled up in the bush, and he sat there fighting it long enough for the police to arrest him. It's there that he confessed to the eight murders, as well as over 250 robberies, which Edgar remembered every single amount of money or article stolen down to the penny for every single robbery. To the point they could give him a specific date like March 10th 1958 and he would say oh yeah a brown coat $39.48. So I'm not sure if he was actually dumb like a lot of people said or if he just had a really good memory or what. I mean not that I really cared the dude deserved what he got anyway but whatever. And Edgar was hanged for his crimes in 1964. Bell Gunness, or Guinness, I'm not sure which way that name goes, is known for murdering at least 14 people from 1884 to 1908. However, I'm pretty sure the actual number is more like 40. See, Bell liked money a lot. Investigators later on said that she was very greedy and sort of hoarded her wealth. And this love of money became evident after in the same day, her house and her candy shop, both of which she co-owned with her husband, burnt to the ground. To which immediately they collected the insurance payments for, which Belle liked a lot, and this was seemingly the spark that led to all of her future crimes. It started after two of her children died of lower intestinal inflammation. Now this was the 1880s, so it's not like you could do a full spread autopsy with a medical examiner like you could do today. However, it is known that a lot of poisons lead to intestinal inflammation, so there's a good chance. And the reason I say there's a good chance is because she had immediately taken out insurance on both of the babies 
and then cashed out immediately after they died. To make it especially interesting, none of her neighbors have ever reported that they saw her pregnant. And then, not too long after that, her husband dies of a supposed hemorrhage. But not only did he die of a hemorrhage, he died on the day that his insurance policy expired and coincidentally, a new one started. I mean, he died in the correct 24 hour time frame for her to take out both policies. Which if you're curious, those two policies came out to $5,000 total, which in 1880 was a lot of money. Doing some basic math with an inflation calculator, it's about 133,000 by today's standards. She then remarried to a man who had a baby with him the baby died again, to which, of course, she took out the insurance money. And then that husband suspiciously died after a meat grinder fell onto his head from the top shelf, crushing his skull and killing him. To which she got about 3000 from that policy. At this point, the police and doctors were getting suspicious of her, so she decided it was time to leave town and move out to the countryside. However, she would leave ads up around the city saying that she has a bunch of property which she bought with suspiciously acquired money and that she's looking for a new husband. So men would write to her, she'd invite them to come, however, they always had to bring money. <laughs> as a down payment on the wedding, I guess. And none of those men were ever seen again, which is why the number has to be way closer to 40. This went on for a while until in 1908, the brother of one of the men who went courting Belle had told his brother that, hey, I'm gonna go to this lady's house, just so you know, and then the family never heard from him again. After that, brother wrote a letter to the residents saying that he was gonna come look for his brother, the house suspiciously burnt down. Bell was supposedly killed in this fire because they found the bodies of Bell, or supposedly Bell, and her children in the rubble, which Bell had a couple kids that she hadn't killed for insurance money, at least didn't have the chance to. And during the investigation of the property, police found 14 bodies buried on the grounds, which is where the 14 figure comes from. The reason they believe that Belle died in the fire is because they found the body of a woman who was headless for some reason in the house fire itself. However, the body was at least five inches shorter than how tall Belle was to be reported and about 50 pounds lighter. Not to mention, why did she lose her head in a house fire? That didn't stop the papers from saying that this was Belle's body and that she's dead. To add to it, a farmhand who Belle had an on-again, off-again affair with said that Belle came to him and told him that the brother of one of her victims was coming to visit. And the farmhand, who had been an accomplice in several of her crimes by killing men and disposing of the bodies, was told to kill a nearby woman, throw her body in the house, burn it all down while she escapes out of the country. So I think it's pretty clear that Belle didn't die there. However, she's never been found because the official story was she died in the fire. There was never a big investigation to find her. So she simply just disappeared, which I mean, she's probably dead now since, you know, she'd have to be like 160 years old to still be alive. But just on the off chance she is, Belle, if you're out there right now, I hate you. Gary Heidnick killed two people from 1986 to 1987, and I know just hearing that number, you may be thinking, oh, well, just two, that's not a lot compared to the others, but um, just wait till we get to the details of it. Gary Heidnick was hailed as being a very bright kid at a young age, and even tested with an IQ of 148. However, he certainly acted like it and had a narcissistic personality, as he told several kids his age that they were simply not worthy to speak to him. During high school, he joined the military, but was shortly afterwards honorably discharged after he was diagnosed with schizoid personality disorder. He spent a long time in and out of mental institutions during this before getting out and deciding to turn his ideas towards investments. Basically, he found a local Methodist church that he said he could do the accounting through, and through basic investments, he turned a bank account and a church that started out with only five people when he found it into a massive church amassing $500,000. However, he had no care for religion or the church itself. He just saw a group of people that he could take advantage of and use as 
as a foundation in order to start making money. Shortly after marrying a woman that he had only communicated with by mail in the Philippines, she divorced him after finding him in bed with three other women, to which after the event she found him, he would start making her watch. And then other times he would abuse her and do a bunch of other mean things to her, so she left him. He ended up having a total of three kids, one with the aforementioned wife, and two with other random hookups that he had. One of those children was his first brush in with the law because the woman that he had the child with was a very mentally ill woman um, that he had checked out of a essentially assisted living home for the mentally disabled. So he comes, he checks her out as someone who knows her, does that with her, she ends up getting pregnant, he gets found out and gets a slap on the wrist basically for doing it. It was after this that the real horror started. Gary kidnapped five women and put them in a sort of makeshift torture pit that he had constructed in his basement. In this pit, he would do all means of physical torture to them and psychological torture, including things like electrocution and cutting and stabbing. And in one case, one of the survivors mentioned that he would take a screwdriver and shove it in there until they couldn't hear, which is brutal. It was during one of these torture sessions that one of the women died of supposedly shock. Uh, so he took her body, dismembered it, and then placed it in bags in the fridge labeled as dog food. To which the night that the whole dismemberment occurred, police were actually called to the house because of the foul odor, to which Gary answered the door and said, oh sorry, I've got a pig cooking and I let it burn too long, and the police just waved him goodnight and left. The other one of his murder victims died after he had filled the bottom part of the pit with water and then took an electric cord and threw it in there to electrocute them and one of them died of shock, like literal shock. Gary was eventually caught after one of his victims tricked him. See, after that lady had died of the electric shock, he took another one of the younger, less damaged looking victims out in order for her to try to find a new victim to lure to the car for him to kidnap. And this specific girl, appealing to his ego, said, well, my parents are probably gonna send the police looking because I've been gone for a couple weeks. Why don't you let me go call them at a payphone so they don't bother us? To which, as soon as she got to the payphone, she immediately called the police. The police showed up, arrested Gary, and then figured out everything he was doing. To which, during the initial questioning, Gary <laughs> said, that the women in the basement he was torturing were there whenever he bought the house. Which has got to be, and again, it's so brutal and evil what he did, but it has to be one of the funniest defenses I've ever heard. Literally, the police are like, all these tortured people, you do that? And he's like, that, that was there when I got here. <laughs> During his trial, he took the insanity plea, which was actually rejected because of the church fund thing that I mentioned earlier. Because as the prosecution said, someone who's so insane wouldn't know how to build up $500,000 in a church fund. And Gary was sentenced to death and given the lethal injection in 1999. Richard Kuklinski, also known as the Iceman, which is way too cool of a name for a killer, is confirmed to have killed five people leading up to his arrest in 1986. However, he claims that the number's closer to 200. Um, we'll get to that. Richard's criminal career began in the 1960s when he began selling bootleg copies of Disney films, which we can all see is the very clearly set Disney to murder pipeline, before figuring out that it was much more profitable to sell prints of adult movies. Throughout everything I'm going to mention, I want you to keep in mind that Richard was only ever arrested once before the murder arrest, for a bad check, which he didn't do any jail time for because he just paid it off. The first man he killed, he shot to death while selling tape, supposedly because the deal went bad, and simply stuffed his body in an oil drum and ditched it. The second was a pharmacist. See, one of the jobs that Richard did was he collected stolen goods and then sold them as his own sort of like storefront black market. And a pharmacist had been pushing pills on him to sell at his shop, and Richard didn't want to do it. And then after going to meet Richard one day, Richard killed the pharmacist. For a long time, it was figured out by investigators later that Richard ran a crime ring with four other criminals. Around the time the investigations began of him and his accomplices, Richard got paranoid and killed one of the members of his inner ring. He did this by feeding his accomplice a cyanide-laced hamburger 
and then having him and another one of his friends hide the body. He then killed that partner who helped him move the body, afraid that he would snitch over the original murder. It was during this time that a body was found in the middle of the woods by police, who upon examination had ice crystals inside of the actual corpse. What that means is that the body had been in a freezer for a very long time before getting dumped. It was later figured out that the body had in fact been in a freezer for 15 months before Richard got paranoid that they were going to look for the body there, so he decided to ditch it so long after the actual murder occurred. This is what got him the nickname of the Iceman. And in order to shut down Richard, a big undercover investigation was launched with the FBI and the ATF, in order to stop him. So an undercover agent who had been undercover for 18 months became close with Richard, and then sure enough, one day, Richard asked for cyanide. That undercover agent asked Richard to carry out a hit for him using the cyanide, which of course wasn't real cyanide. So on his way to do the hit, Richard got to thinking, maybe that guy's not legit. So he feeds the cyanide to a stray dog that he passes by, and the dog doesn't do anything, so he's like, I think that guy was lying to me. <laughs> so he tries to go back home knowing the whole thing's a sting, but gets arrested anyway. He got arrested and was eventually sentenced to prison for life or 111 years, which same thing. And it was after he was arrested that the stories got absurd. For example, he claimed, as I mentioned earlier, that he's killed like 200 people. He says that he just kills homeless people for fun all the time by shooting them or poisoning them or whatever else. He said that he personally knew John Gotti and that John Gotti personally commissioned him on several of the hits that he performed. He said that he was closely tied with all five families of New York, which is a big thing in the Mafia, and that he would perform hits on the five families and then perform a hit for that family against the family he just performed the hit for, and even claimed that he himself murdered Jimmy Hoffa. And while there's some connections, like people have really dug into his reports and been like well he was seen with this guy so maybe this murder's legit so there may be a few extra murders but the degree in which he claimed to be would have made him like the most prolific gangster ever bar none and this is the guy who got arrested because he almost tried to kill someone with fake cyanide so i don't think it's that legit richard died in 2006 of a heart attack which his wife had signed a do not resuscitate order for on him because i mean of course she did and interestingly enough Richard was played by Michael Shannon in a movie titled The Iceman, which is a story about the events of his life, or at least the supposed events of his life. Arthur Shower Ross, also known as the Genesee River Killer, killed 14 people from 1972 to 1989. Arthur was cited at a young age as having very low intelligence and never succeeded well in school, and also was involved in several... Um, how do I put this? Relationships with people he shouldn't have relationships with, as in immediate family, which I'm sure had a very positive effect on his mental well-being as he got older. He was drafted into the Vietnam War and had several stories afterwards of how he used to like be in these violent combat scenarios and how he used to skin and decapitate people and how cool he was, but it turns out later that he never saw combat and was simply stationed behind the lines. And it was shortly after he got back to the States that he got in a lot of trouble for arson, to which a psychiatrist later said that he was a sort of sexual arsonist, which is a phrase that I never thought I'd say on this channel, but I guess I should have known better. Basically, he would start these fires because they got him started. And in total, he served 22 months in prison for those arson events. Not long after this, Arthur was arrested after it came out that he had assaulted and killed two young children ages 8 and 10. However, he got the charge down to a manslaughter plea. The reason for this being, although he had confessed, uh, there wasn't a ton of evidence linking it to it, and you may be thinking, well, isn't a confession enough? But according to the judge and the attorneys, he was so dumb that a confession didn't mean anything. And not only that, the prosecution was certain that if he is put on trial 
the jury will feel sympathy for how dumb he is and therefore will get the charge down to manslaughter anyway, so they might as well plea on it. So he was given parole after only being in jail for 14 years for the murder of two children and then immediately murdered 12 more people. These were mostly sex workers that he would approach and then hire and then strangle and ditch their body somewhere. The way he was caught is <laughs> while police were investigating a recent place that they found the body, he just walked up to, like at the bridge above where the body was dumped and just peed over it. So they go up there to ask him and then just figure out supposedly by his own confession that he was the one that dumped the body. And at trial, his argument was that he is not guilty by reason of insanity because of the PTSD that he suffered from Vietnam. So then they had several of the larger scale commanders who are familiar with his operation come in and testify that this dude never saw combat and has no idea what he's talking about. And Arthur died in 2008 while in prison of a heart attack. Joseph D'Angelo is guilty of at least 13 murders from 1973 to 1986. Joseph specifically went on three separate murder sprees across three different areas of California to the point that it was believed that these events were done by three different killers. Eventually, once investigators began to put together that this was all one person, he was given the name of the Golden State Killer. Also, interesting note, whenever they thought it was three different killers, one of those aliases was called the Night Stalker before the actual Night Stalker that we know now. So whenever they figured out it was all the Golden State Killer, they then re-adopted the name as soon as Richard Ramirez became a killer. Just interesting fact. Joseph was in the military before becoming a police officer. However, he was kicked off the force for stealing a hammer for some reason. And then after being fired, threatened the life of the chief of police who fired him. Initially, his crime started off as thievery, in several occasions he would literally steal piggy banks like there was several times that he would walk by like expensive jewelry and stuff like that and steal things like pocket change and i'm not kidding like actual piggy banks the first known murder is when he was kidnapping a girl while walking out of the family house and her father heard came downstairs to stop him he shot the father and ran away to which the father died it's not long after this that his crimes became much more extreme what he would normally do is he would break into the houses of young married couples with a gun and then force the woman to tie up the man and blindfold him to which he would then tie up the woman's hands and mouth and abuse her in a number of intense ways for hours on end. During this time, he would simply eat the food that they had made, drink the stuff out of their fridge, and just walk around the house casually, coming back to the woman to repeatedly abuse her. He would also do these really demented things, like sort of mind games. For example, he would take dishes, and he would lay the men flat on their back and stack the dishes on their back and say that if he hears the dishes move, in other words, the man trying to get up, uh, he'll kill both of them. He did this 50 times. Like, no joke, this guy broke into houses, did this whole like six hour charade, tying people up and abusing them and all of that 50 times and only had a hiccup on the 50th time. That hiccup was while getting away, two people saw him, to which he pulled his gun and shot both of them. After this, I guess he was kind of off his game and then tried to do the same break-in thing again, only this time the couple managed to get away. So after that, he killed the couple every single time he did it. Getting information out of him was hard and pulling teeth, but they know that there were at least five other instances that he broke into a house, did the whole thing, and killed the couple. Although, there's probably more that he just didn't talk about. Also, during this entire thing, he was sending letters to the local newspapers and police, and he would even do really creepy stuff like call the house that he was about to rob, by calling them and then they'd answer and he'd say this is the wrong number and then he'd start talking about stuff he's going to do to the women and the people was like oh this is a weird prank call and then he'd bust in and do it once dna testing became a big thing the killing stopped however of course they were still looking for him which means there was like a 30 year gap between him stopping the killings and him actually getting arrested for it and his neighbors in that time said that he was like the worst person they ever met he would call them threatening to kill them if their dog bark too much he would always yell at the neighbors and had a horribly kept house pretty much this guy was awful and he never learned anything in 2018 he was finally arrested to which his defense was he had a split personality and the other personality 
Jerry was in his head telling him to commit these acts. See, issue being because the statute of limitations, they couldn't charge him for all of the assaults and kidnappings, but they could get him on the murders. So he took a plea deal on the murders, gave the police the details, and is currently serving a life sentence to this day. However, while researching, he was more recently moved to protective custody, which if you don't know, protective custody is traditionally a whole lot more laid back than regular prison. So this piece of filth murders so many people and then hurts so many more and then gets 30 years to be free and continue being a jerk and is now setting cozy in some sort of cushy cell where he may have YouTube and is able to watch this video right now. So, um, Joseph D'Angelo, I hate you. David Park Ray is suspected of killing up to 60 people from 1950 to 1999. He was known as the Toy Box Killer because of his horrifying saw trap contraption that we're gonna talk about. As a very young child, David's father, who was an alcoholic, would give him several masochist adult magazines. And David said from that point on, he became obsessed with the fantasy of tying up and torturing women. So he constructed a trailer truck that in the trailer of it had a massive torture room full of chairs and all kinds of gadgets and gizmos. To list a few of the things that were recovered from the back of the trailer, there were chains, whips, straps, clamps, scalpels, shock devices, saws, diagrams, syringes, and toys. And I'll let your imagination go with the toy thing. What he would do is kidnap women by a variety of different means. Sometimes he would pose to be an authority figure in order to get them to come check out something in the trailer, or other times simply pick up women off the side of the road, before heavily drugging them until they were in a very non-combative state, and then putting them back there where he would spend the next few days just... Yeah. Some weird details about it is he put mirrors on the ceiling of the trailer because he said he wanted them to always see exactly what he was doing. And his wife helped him get these women and even participated in the abuse, as well as several of his friends who he would have come over and they would take turns. And then he had a device set up um, in order for his dog. Anyway, the way he was finally caught is when one day a young girl was approached by him pretending to be a police officer saying she needs to come check something out. He throws her in the trailer and he starts to abduct her. That day David had to go to work and this potential victim be found a way to get out of her chains to which the only person in the trailer was David's wife. The young girl managed to stab David's wife and got away and then ran down the road to get help wearing nothing but an iron collar and the chain garment that she had attached to her. She then got to a house to which she got a phone, called the police, and David and his wife were arrested. It was after this that a woman came forward saying that she was also a victim of Ray, however she had reported it as soon as she got away and the police just didn't believe her that there was this guy driving around with a makeshift torture trailer abducting people. And another woman got away who was also kidnapped by Ray. However, after two days of torture, Ray thought he killed her, so he ditched her on the side of the road. She wasn't dead, she was alive, wakes up, went home to her family, to which her husband thought she was lying and had actually been in an affair and made up this whole story about a serial killer with a torture machine in the back of a trailer, that he divorced her. Which, I hope that guy feels awful about it later. See, the reason only three women ended up remembering enough to come forward is because David had them drugged for one during the whole event, so they were already had a foggy recollection, but after he ditched them somewhere, he would give them an, an amnestic so that they forgot a lot of what happened. There are several women who have came forward in years after believing that they were victims of Ray. However, the entire thing at the time just seemed like a dream. But whenever they saw it on the news and heard the details, they began to remember more and more aspects and it became real. After a lot of questioning, what they eventually got Ray on is that Ray killed one of his partners who helped him with the whole kidnapping and torturing of women because supposedly that, she, that he was gonna snitch and then another one of his partners had killed his wife 
who was also going to snitch, so Ray did the whole torture thing with her and then killed her, so they managed to get him on two murders. Not only that, but in investigation, Ray had filmed one of the times that he did it, and of course the woman was never identified afterwards, so they at least got that as an abuse situation, uh, if not missing person, suspected murder, you know the bit. And Ray never really talked about anything, so yeah, while it was at least two murdered, um, you don't build a big trailer contraption like that and only end up kidnapping, what, a total of four women? So the actual number that he probably did is way, 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 way higher, and a bunch of women at the time just thought they had a bad nightmare when in actuality, yeah. Because of this, they gave him a total of 224 years in jail because they just gave him the max for everything they could. Like, oh, what's that? You got a ticket four years ago? Looks like that's 10 years added on, buddy. They, in the meantime, also arrested David's wife as well as his friend, who was the husband of one of the aforementioned victims. The friend is going up for parole this year, actually, and the wife was released from jail in 2019. David himself was sentenced again to the 224 years and then driven to jail to give another interrogation and testimony and then died of a heart attack before the interrogation even began. So yeah, this other guy may get out and she got out, but David's dead and I've got to look on the bright side of something. Peter Curtin, also known as the Vampire of Dusseldorf, was known to have committed at least nine murders from February to November of 1929. Peter was the oldest of 13 children, who all of which were horrifically abused by their father. Among things you could kind of predict like beatings and odd punishments to children, his father also did a form of voyeurism in which him and his wife would and then force the children to see. Um, I'm sure that didn't have any effect on his mental well-being growing up. And before he was even grown up to begin with, at the age of five, Peter attempted to drown one of his friends. So, you know, a good sign of things to come. And at the age of nine, he befriended a dog catcher within his sort of apartment complex that he lived in. However, the dog catcher was also an alcoholic who would pretty much just catch dogs and then torture and kill them. So Peter joined him on that and seemed to enjoy it. His first murders, although they wouldn't be found out till many years later, occurred when he was only nine years old. One day while out on a raft, Peter pushed his friend who he knew couldn't swim into the water, to which another one of Peter's friends tried to jump into the water to save the first kid, and then Peter held the rescuer underwater, therefore drowning both of them. However, at the time, it was just believed that these two children drowned accidentally, and at the time, no suspicion or charges were given to Peter. So, by the age of 13, uh, Peter had ramped up the evil, and he would do this by and I'm stressing at this point, viewer discretion, kids, close your ears, don't watch this. He would begin engaging in kith with animals, and then he could only get there by stabbing them. This would inevitably lead to his interest later in life when he realized it also worked if he did the same thing to people. This supposedly quit when he was spotted stabbing the neighbor's pig for reasons previously described. And that same year, he stole all of the boss's money who he was working an apprenticeship under and then ran away. It was around this time that, according to Peter, he had strangled a girl, not to the point of killing her, just to the point of her passing out, and during it got very excited to the point he realized that the murder, or at least the almost murder, was a replacement for the whole stabbing animals thing. He spent the next few years getting arrested for various crimes like arson and fraud and other wholesome activities, and even was drafted into the German military for a while and then deserted, so he went to jail for that too. It was during this time that he would fantasize in prison about what he wanted to do once he got out, 
that motivated the crimes he would later commit. One night while performing a break-in, he came across a nine-year-old girl alone in her bedroom. While in there, he managed to stab her to death, which again excited him, before he left and then returned to the bar across the street the next day. He did this because he was so happy with the remorse and disgust of the patrons in the bar discussing the murder that had happened the night previous across the street. And if that wasn't depraved enough, Peter would regularly return to that nine-year-old girl's grave after this event because just touching the soil on top of the coffin enthralled him. Moving on from here, all of the killings he committed were a physical motivation. He figured out that the only way that he could really get excited was through murder. And not only murder, the more depraved the better. Aside from various torture methods like slowly assanguinating his victims or enjoying watching them die, he would plan other large-scale things to freak people out. Like for example, one of his victims who he had killed in a field and then buried there, he had planned to go back two days later so that he could drag out the corpse and then crucify it on a tree coming into town because the idea of people seeing it and being horrified again made him very the opposite of horrified while the initial killings were done with objects like scissors and knives later on in his killings they were majority done with a hammer but what's really wild is the seeming case of divine intervention that got Peter arrested. Okay, so to explain how he got arrested, you've got to go on this little trip with me. So there was a woman coming into Dusseldorf that has no relation to Peter or any of these murders that are happening. Upon arriving in the town, a man offered to escort her home. And while walking home, he suggested they cut through an empty park as a quicker means of getting where she's going. She's starting to feel weird about walking alone through essentially the woods with this random man protested and he began to grab her while this was happening another man sprinted up and did the whole is this guy bothering you to which the original attacker left and she said thank you to this man who saved her that man who saved her was peter so then peter says oh ma'am i'll walk you home and then on the way there begins to assault her but since they were semi in public she began to scream to which peter began to get freaked out and then ran away and then after having been attacked twice in one day the woman then goes home and writes about it in a letter she mails to her friend back where she came from however she wrote the address wrong on the letter which made the post office go well we might as well check it so when they open it and read the description of what i just said they went this sounds a lot like the vampire of Dusseldorf, because at the time the police had this huge manhunt in order to find the killer. So the police go to the woman who wrote the letter. She says that Peter had mentioned where he lived, and sure enough, whenever they go there, they find Peter Curtin's address. So had it not been for the random guy attacking her, and then Peter just so happening to be there, her surviving, getting the letter wrong, and then the fact that Peter told her where he lived, he may have never came to justice, at least not anytime soon. Peter wasn't home whenever the police showed up, so for a brief amount of time he was in hiding, as his wife, who I mentioned earlier, had told him to hide. And then eventually he tells his wife that she should turn him in and collect the reward money, which she does. It was during the trial that followed more of the specifics of the killings came to light like the ones i mentioned earlier and despite peter coming forward clean and saying that he was guilty his defense tried to argue that he was insane and essentially tried to form the whole narrative that he was a sadist who didn't know any better however whenever those two drownings that i mentioned in the beginning came to light that kind of proved that it wasn't always just because he had something wrong in his brain it was also the fact that he just liked to kill the reason he got the nickname the vampire of dusseldorf is because many of his victims were found drained and it turns out it was because peter would in fact drink their blood he had absolutely zero motion at his sentencing and when given the death penalty didn't seem to care to which he was sentenced to death by guillotine in his final words he asked the executioner about the guillotine if for a brief moment after his head was chopped off if he would be able to hear the blood spurting from his own neck to which he said that would be the pleasure to end all pleasures. I should also mention why there's nine confirmed murders. There are about 31 
other murders that is believed to have been committed by him. It was just never proven in the 1920s. So Peter was a voraciously evil man up until the end. And I really have nothing more to add. He was called the vampire for a reason. Next person. <laughs> Donald Henry Gaskins was confirmed to have killed 13 people from 1970 to 1975. Standing at 5'4 and weighing 130 pounds, he was much more commonly known as Pee Wee, which is the name that the press and later stories would refer to him as. It was believed by many at the time that Donald had a split personality disorder, although the validity of that is debated in modern psychiatry. Although at a young age, he suffered considerable abuse from his parents, which could contribute to a condition similar to that. And at the age of only one he drank a bottle of kerosene that led to him having convulsions until he was about three years old so i'm sure that did something to his mental stability and also the whole bottle like like you would think after the first sip it'd be like uh but to just continue to drink it <laughs> to give you an idea of how neglected peewee was by his parents he mostly lived on the street and did these sort of gang crimes with a group of quote unquote friends and had never heard his real name henry until he heard it read by a judge at the age of 13 when he was on trial for an assault of someone. Like imagine that, never knowing your real name until a judge reads it to you because you may be going to jail. He was sentenced to jail or juvie, correctional schooling, whatever, at the age of 13 and was repeatedly abused by the other males at the facility. During that time he broke out, got away, found a girl and married her, before turning himself back in to finish the rest of his sentence, to which he finally got out at 18. After this, he had several in and out stints in prison from various theft or assault charges, but he always maintained respect while in prison despite his size. For example, in one stint, on the first day, he simply killed the biggest, scariest guy in the jail, to which everyone else respected him. What wouldn't be known to people until later on is that while he was doing these other charges he was being arrested for, he was also committing several pleasure killings. Or in other words, he would simply go out and for fun, find a hitchhiker who he would kidnap and then kill and mutilate their body. In some cases, even claiming to have cannibalized his victims. During this time, he claims that he has committed up to 80 murders just for fun. However, that may be boistering a bit because again, he valued his opinion as a tough guy. And it's believed by many that the 13 confirmed kills that he had were all done as either a personal or a hit. In other words, he would get mad at someone he was semi-related to or knew in real life and then kill them, or he would quite literally be paid to kill someone. The reason for this being bodies and evidence have never been found, although that is possible on a spree killing this large, but you would think that they would eventually find maybe a couple bodies. So the whole thing that he would just go out and kill for fun isn't exactly corroborated, although he definitely killed a few people and was as brutal to their bodies as he claimed. One of his associates would later tell police that Gaskins would regularly see missing people on the news and then laugh saying that's someone he killed and that they'll never find the body. But again, no confirmation if that's true or if that's just him trying to sound tough. So once the police caught up to him just through his various crimes that he committed and eventually connecting the dots on the bodies, they had him suspected on about nine different murders and then went through with trying him on one. So whenever he was finally convicted of that murder he was given the death penalty but because of some weird complication in south carolina they overturned it to a life sentence so as soon as they did he immediately confessed to the other eight murders because he really lucked out on getting lucky enough that it went from a death sentence to a life sentence so he figured while he's getting lucky might as well confess to the other eight before he can try him on those to make sure he doesn't get the death penalty so on his account sounds pretty lucky right until he messed that up while he was in jail his cell was located nearby to a man who was in there for committing a double homicide. What had happened is this guy had attempted to rob a gas station and he killed the two owners, a husband and wife who owned it, before making his getaway and getting caught. The son of those two store owners 
thought that this guy deserved death and was very upset whenever the state put him in jail. So somehow, the son somehow gets in contact with Henry, knowing of his criminal history, and pays him $2,000 to kill the man that had killed his own parents. So Henry, who had lucked out on getting a life sentence, decided to throw all of that under the bus and just straight up kill somebody. He had originally planned to use poison, which has some form of plausible deniability, uh, but when that didn't work, he moved to C4. What he did is he took this sort of radio walkie-talkie contraption and lined the inside of it with C4, and then gave it to the guy he was supposed to kill and said it's this device that he smuggled in that will allow them to talk between cells. And that all this guy had to do was hold it up to his ear and then plug it into a wall outlet. And as soon as he tried that, it blew up. To which Henry would later say the last thing that guy ever heard was him laughing from a couple cells away as his head exploded. Because of this, the papers began to refer to Henry as the meanest man in America. So for this killing, he got a whole new trial to which this time he was given the death sentence and it was not overturned. Which, fun fact, was the first time in the state of South Carolina a white man was ever sentenced to death for murdering a black man. It was during this time that Henry had said he had murdered about 110 people. However, as previously mentioned, like 90 of those he just said and there's no evidence found. And among the people he claimed to kill was like a senator's daughter who went missing. So like, I think he was just like trying to show off. And he was executed by electric chair in 1991, to which his final words when asked if he had any were, I'll let my lawyers do the talk for me, I'm ready to go. And so Pee Wee died by electric chair in South Carolina. I guess you could say the guy had a short circuit. Uh-huh. Okay, moving on. Jack Unterweger killed 10 women from 1974 to 1994. And it's everything that he did within those 20 years that makes it so interesting. At the age of four years old, Jack began to live with his grandfather, who was a violent man who stole farm animals, because, you know, child abuse is a common thread with these guys. And from a young age was in trouble with the law for the aforementioned stealing farm animals, because often what would happen is if they were stealing, say, a goat from another farmer's property, whenever the police showed up the grandpa would just run so jack would normally catch the heat for it and as he grew up jack went from being sort of touchy with women to full-on assaulting them and it finally culminated when jack was 24 years old and he murdered a woman by strangling her to death with her own bra to which jack was promptly caught tried and convicted and then thrown in jail with a 15 to life sentence while in prison jack demonstrated a superb sense of writing and from his cell wrote various plays poems and even an autobiography. From this, he managed to develop an insane cult following from people outside of prison. People read his autobiography in which he talked about how sorry he was, people read his poems and books and thought that he was such a romantic, charismatic guy, and therefore several petitions began to get him released from jail, with many of the petitions saying the government should pardon him and let him out of jail early. And while that never happened, he was eventually given in the minimal sentence of 15 years and got out of prison for murder in an incredibly small amount of time. From there, radios were playing audio of his poems and books being read out loud, and even children in European schools were reading his autobiography as it was sort of boistered as this poster boy for criminal reform. And everyone was pretty much in agreement that the fact he went to jail and then had all these beautiful things to say was proof that that people really can change because apparently people don't think that murderers can be charming and from there he showed up on several different interviews and daytime television shows and eventually got a job as a tv news reporter and around this time guess what he started killing again which all of his killings followed the exact same modus operandi where he would attack women assault them, and then strangle them to death with their own bras. And since he was a TV news reporter, and most of his victims were victims of opportunity in his region, you can see where this is going, Jack would regularly do the reporting on his own killing spree being the reporter on the ground. So he would stand there and narrate how an investigation was going for a person that he just murdered. Which I have no idea how that went over. I don't speak German, so I can't, like, 
read and see the original clips, but that had to be like, okay, so he's he's there on the field talking about these dead women who were murdered, and he'd had to be like, um, the, as you can see, um, the police are here for a woman that is dead and assaulted and also strangled with her own br why am i pretending to hold a microphone i got as you can see <laughs> and she was also strangled with her own bra uh it's a good thing we've never seen a killing like that before uh <laughs> like was everyone so dumb they didn't put together that the famous tv reporter who murdered a woman with her own bra reporting on several local killings of murdered women with their own bra had like any connection not only that but whenever the news wanted to do a brief sort of documentary about crime in the united states they sent jack to la to do it and while in la two more women were murdered in the exact same circumstance and they still didn't what eventually someone by the grace of god managed to put together that the two might be connected and for a brief stint of time jack was on the run and would do things like call the police to convince them that he was innocent although you know that's not exactly what an innocent person does but i digress to which he was convicted of a further nine murders from the one that happened about 20 years ago and then the night of his conviction he hanged himself in his own jail cell and in a lot of these stories i read what seemingly just dumb people surrounding a case whether it be investigators or the public at large. But here, like, and I know hindsight's 2020 and all, but like, did no one put that together? <laughs> Mikhail Popkov killed 81 women, and yes, you heard me right, 81, from 1992 to 2010. Not much is known about his life growing up, although, you know, the intense hatred of women probably had some developmental standing but early on Mikhail became a police officer before taking a semi-retirement job as a security guard at a chemical facility what motivated his initial killings according to him was he believed his wife was cheating on him whenever he found two rappers in the trash can of his home she was also in law enforcement and it turned out later that she was with a previous one of his colleagues and this angered him enough that he decided to just take his hatred out on seemingly women at random the reason that he was able to perform killings for that long and that many people without getting caught is because the range of his killings was over 2,000 miles what he would do is he would use the cop car that he still had as well as don his policeman's uniform and then drive through towns looking for girls he believed to be intoxicated to which he would then offer them a ride home and once they got in his vehicle he would restrain them before taking them somewhere desolate very heavily beating and torturing them before murdering them. As mentioned, a lot of these killings were rage motivated, so he would absolutely devastate the bodies to the point that several of them were totally unrecognizable as people. It was for the ferocity of these murders that he was given the name the werewolf, which again is way too cool, but I'm just going to keep going. Also, and information on him is kind of like sparse for some reason like people don't really dig into the details as much as i'd like but i saw several mentions that among the murder weapons he would use like things stolen from police evidence lockups which on the surface level you're like oh that means nothing could be traced back to him or whatever but like wouldn't using things that had to be taken from a police station pretty much like draw the confirmation that it was a police officer i have to be missing something there but like like if at whatever police station he is able to walk into and take an axe from and then they find an axe at a crime scene they're like huh that's weird during this entire thing mikhail was living a perfectly normal life to the point that he was revered as a respected member of the community and his children and wife thought of him as a very loving husband to give you an idea of how non-suspicious this guy was one of the victims that from everything i could tell was totally random was his daughter's elementary school teacher so because of the tragedy of this teacher murdered at the height of her life the school began a charity donation in order to help the family with funeral costs to which mikhail was one of the highest contributing donors 
and gave some words of grace to the family and like seemingly helped them with the burial and everything. And one of the girls that he attempted to murder actually survived and positively identified him. What had happened is he killed her by beating her head against a tree. Like I said, the guy was very brutal. But although he thought it killed her, it actually just knocked her out. And whenever she got up and went to the police, she was able to ID him. However, his wife, thinking this to be some absurd misunderstanding, gave him a false alibi that she was with him on the night of the attempted murder. And the police, believing him to be such a great guy, pretty much just shut up the girl's testimony and went on from there. What eventually got Russian investigators to get a hold of him was at the crime scenes, they began to put together that the tire tracks on the ground were a specific match to police vehicles at the time. Again, don't know how the weapons from evidence lockers didn't also trip that same thing, but whatever. And after doing a DNA test to almost every cop in Russia, they managed to find a link between his DNA and the one that he would leave at crime scenes. He was eventually charged with 22 murders, but then later, after they did all the math, it came out to 83, which makes him Russia's most prolific serial killer. And Mikhail is still alive in jail in Russia to this day. William Bonin, also known as the Freeway Killer, killed at least 21 boys from 1979 to 1980. And I talk about like a lot of messed up guys in the series, and I have so far, and they all are. Um, but William Bonin's particularly evil for reasons I'm going to talk about, and this is going to be... I, I don't know how to like talk about the details of this without being really gross, so again, the whole viewer discretion thing. Anyway, at a young age, Bonin had an abusive father who would regularly beat him, and also would normally give him to his grandfather who was a known child predator. And after several years of that cycle of abuse, Bonin's mother put him and his two brothers into an orphanage so that they would be away from his father and grandfather's care. However, that turned out to not be any better as the orphanage itself was also super abusive and would normally do things like dunking kids' heads underwater and nearly drowning them or forcing them to get into fistfights with each other and yada yada. It was also common for him to be assaulted in various ways by boys older than himself to which, and this matters later, he would allow them to do it if they first tied his hands up because then he enjoyed it. And then after his mother got away from his abusive father, she took him back at the age of nine years old. Yes, all of this happened before the kid was nine. And at the age of 10, he got arrested and sent to juvie for stealing license plates, to which, you guessed it, in juvie, he was rapidly abused again. In all of these killings, especially the more evil ones that we see, there is a very clear connection between abuse of childhood equaling them becoming an abuser later in life. And whenever I talk about this stuff, I don't want it to seem like an excuse or an excusal method at all. Because with this case, as well as the others, at some point the victim becomes the attacker. And especially with cases like I'm about to describe, I don't want it to come off as a means of reason for these crimes, but more so a means of causation, if that makes sense. So basically, I'm not bringing up these points in order to soften the blow of how horrible these people were, but more so as a means of evil begatting evil. And as we can see in this case, much of the time, the apple that falls from the tree is much, much worse than the tree that it fell from. Around the end of his adolescence, his mother essentially forced him into a marriage with a woman because his mom believed him to be homosexual. Um, however, there's a big difference between homosexual and the things he was actually doing. Like, he would regularly offer young children beer um, and then get them drunk so that he could have his way, and around the time he turned 18, he joined the military to fight in Vietnam. He fought as an aerial gunner and even earned an award for saving the life of a fellow airman. However, it was during this time in Vietnam that he began to develop the idea that life itself is pretty overrated. And while over there, he assaulted two other fellow military airmen by holding them at gunpoint and making himself have his way with him. After getting out of the military, he developed a habit of kidnapping young boys, tying them up, doing deeds, 
before releasing them and then dumping them somewhere on the road, although he wasn't killing them yet. In 1969, he was arrested for doing this on five separate occasions and got convicted, and here comes the part where I get mad about the legal system. Because of his history and the fact that people who talked to him saw that something was very clearly off in his demeanor, instead of prison, he was sent to a psychiatric hospital. He was in the psychiatric hospital for about two years before they sent him to prison because he wouldn't stop assaulting the other male inmates. So since he never was sentenced to prison, he was instead sentenced to a psychiatric hospital until he quote unquote rehabilitated or whatever. And then the hospital couldn't handle him, so they send him to prison. He technically doesn't have a sentence. It's still just till he's rehabilitated. And after only one year, the police decided that, well, I guess he's good to go and just let him out. To which about three months after getting out of prison, he did the exact same thing again to another young boy. And after a another young boy, three days after that attack, resisted his advances, he tried to hit him with his own car. So someone who has a very vast history of sexual violence and then was convicted of doing horrific acts to five different young boys before being sent to a hospital that he got kicked out of because he couldn't stop there. Got out of jail after one year, and then three months after that, did the same thing again. Just take a guess how long he got sentenced to. He got sentenced to just under three years. And shortly after that is when the killing started. He started attending house parties where he met guys who thought that his interests were cool and he also started picking up his whole activity of getting kids drunk so that he could you know but that wasn't enough for him so with the help of his new accomplices that he would variously rotate through he started his killing spree what would happen is him and one of his accomplices would drive around in a van and just look for boys between the ages of 10 and 17 who were out on their own either at bus stations or walking home from school or hanging out at the beach or whatever as soon as they were in the van his accomplice would begin driving as bonin would tie up the kids and then beat and abuse them in various ways before murdering them most often through strangulation with their own t-shirt and then dumping their bodies on the side of the freeway which gave him the name of the freeway killer and also i have to mention this because i hate the courts during the middle of this murder spree he was arrested on unrelated to these murders a charge of him just molesting a young boy and i say just but you, you get what i mean at this point to which he got out on a clerical error like someone didn't file the paperwork right or whatever so they're like oh you're free to go so the dude was in custody and could have been jailed and the whole killing spree stopped but what is it like the sixth time now that the courts messed up in some way he got loose <sighs> anyway and i don't go into too much of the specific gory details with a lot of these killers i talk about mostly out of respect to the victims involved but also because Especially in the true crime community, there seems to be a lot of gratuitousness or interest taken in the viciousness of the actions. Like for example, I'll give you the facts of how people were killed or the manner that the killer would do it, but I don't like to dwell on the horrors that these people went through. Just because it most often comes down to, in my opinion, focusing on the wrong things and glorifying the heinous nature of these actions. But what I can tell you is that reading through the files and like Bonin's killings in particular, there was something especially evil about them. Like without exaggeration, Bonin loved absolutely every second of it, from planning it out to finding a victim to the act itself. And then he would recollect later on about how obsessed he was with the incredibly gruesome specifics of each case. Like for example, one of the boys who was murdered had $10 in his pocket and after they had ditched his body him and the accomplice he was with drove through a mcdonald's and used the ten dollars in order to get burgers and then while chewing on the burger laughed and said thanks kid which is just like a whole new level of like depravity and hellishness one boy was even picked up and let go at one point 
because Bonin said that there were too many people that saw the boy get into his car. However, that didn't stop Bonin from explaining to the boy exactly what he would have done to him if there weren't any witnesses before dropping him off. And he also did things like collect newspaper clippings, talking about the freeway killings, and would regularly relate to his friends how much he just loved doing it. Whenever all this came to light, one of the accomplices said that at one point, they had just gone through the whole act, murdered a boy, to which Bonin sat there for a minute after they dumped the body and said, I'm bored, let's get another one. And then they killed a second one in the same day. So that boy I mentioned a minute ago who was picked up and then let go, that kid eventually got thrown into jail for some minor crime. And upon hearing people talk about the freeway killers, he told a police officer at the jail that it sounds a whole lot like a guy who picked him up at one point. So based on this boy's testimony, they began a surveillance measure on Bonin himself. To which, after following his van around and then eventually seeing a young boy get into his car, the police converged on the vehicle to which they found him in the back yeah, and Bonin was finally caught and went to trial. All of the accomplices agreed to testify against him in exchange for not receiving the death penalty, except for one accomplice who hung himself upon being caught. During the testimony time of the trial, it was regular for the press as well as family members to leave the room and in some cases begin crying and throwing up outside of the courtroom because the depraved nature of Bonin's actions was just that, very depraved. And during the testimony, several things came forward, like the fact that Bonin just loved the sounds of kids dying and found there was no point in living outside of committing murder. Also, like, there were several points within the court trial. Like, okay, so there's several different murders that he was eventually convicted of or it figured out that he did. However, there were these weird gambit plays that were played within the courtroom. Like, for example, whenever the police initially came and they're like, did you murder that kid? He'd be like, no, but if you don't charge me for it, I can show you where the body is. And like, I know it doesn't matter that much because they still convicted him on like 10 murders, but just the fact that the way courts work is, oh, well, he showed us where this body is, which means he absolutely did it, but because we shook hands, we gotta, you know, not try him for that one, which, again, I know doesn't matter because he was convicted on other ones, but just, like, courts are so dumb <laughs> because potentially due to these very stupid arbitrary rules, and as we saw many times earlier within this very case, people can just get off because of these dumb things that everyone agrees to follow so we have to let evil people go because oh th that's what the secret pinky promise says to do <laughs> finally after all of the misadventures and ways that bone had managed to be let go time and time again he was given the death penalty that didn't stop him from being on death row for 14 years to which he picked up hobbies like painting and other things he shouldn't be allowed to do, and even had these times where he was playing bridge with other famous serial killers from the region at the time. And somehow, he began writing letters to the mothers of the children that he had killed, which for one, who let him do that? But in the letters, there was zero remorse as well. As a matter of fact, to one mother, he said, your son was my favorite. He was the best screamer I ever had. I don't know how, like, we all agreed that someone can do things like that and show zero remorse and we're like well another 11 years of death row for you like finally in 1996 he was killed by lethal injection which was the first lethal injection in the state of california he was described in court as the most arch evil person who ever existed and while i can't you know validate that because there's been so many evil people throughout history he's at least like top 100 Probably. Well, that was painful to get through. Let's get to one with a funny name, even though the killings weren't funny at all, but the doodler. The doodler is known to be responsible for five murders, although some believe the number could be as high as 16 from 1974 to 1975. Now the doodler has never been identified, but the reason he was given this name was for the nature of his killings. Essentially the doodler would go to various gay nightclubs and then entice men by drawing sketches of them. So in other words, he would watch someone from across the bar 
draw a picture of them, walk up to them, and then use that as a flirtation. After this, he would then take them into the beach before stabbing them to death, and then leaving that sketched image on the body as a sort of calling card. That's the reason that there's five confirmed by him and 16 suspected, because five people were found with the sketch on them, and then the other 11 were people that were just murdered in a similar nature near the area, although the sketch was never found. So either those weren't the killing of the doodler or he simply just stopped doing it. The reason that all of this came to light is because there were three men who survived their attack. All three of them gave the exact same story, that a man walked up to them at a nightclub, that he handed them a sketch of themselves, took them to the beach before trying to murder them. That's where sketches like this come from, as well as the explained means of how the murders went down. So off of the testimony of these three men, they eventually found someone who the police believe to be the doodler. This person's identity has never been made public because the three attacked men would not come forward and testify because they didn't want to out themselves as being homosexual. And these three men themselves have never been publicly identified, although the police said that one of them, a leak came through, was a nationally known entertainer. So potentially a large movie star who didn't want to come out as homosexual. And then from here, the stories get weird. Apparently a psychiatrist came forward saying that one of his clients had confess to him to be the doodler killer and the police have apparently interviewed this killer several times around the time that the murder took place but he was never able to be charged because like i mentioned no one was willing to come forward and in 2019 the police said that the doodler is still alive and still their primary suspect for the case but as mentioned there's not much that they can do about it now if no one's willing to say anything. And while it seems good that the doodler hasn't struck again since the initial spree that occurred in the span of two years, that doesn't mean justice shouldn't be done for the families of those murdered. So hopefully either it's this person that the police believe it to be or whoever it is has or will face justice in some way, but there's nothing really for anyone to do except I guess be mad about it. Herb Baumeister was born in 1947 to a rather prominent and wealthy family in Indianapolis. His childhood seemed perfectly normal and he was well taken care of. However, for whatever reason, whenever he became a teenager, he began to act out. One day, for some reason, he peed on his teacher's desk, which is, you know, generally frowned upon. And then later, too, I couldn't find a confirmation that it was the same teacher, but it looked or sounded like from the text that it was the same teacher, he picked up a dead crow off the side of the road and put that in the teacher's desk. Because of actions like this, his parents sent him to a psychiatric hospital so that he could be tested, and he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and multiple personality disorder. After this diagnosis, his parents pulled him from the hospital and he was left untreated. And before you rag on the parents too hard for not treating their son who had a mental disorder, uh, in the 1960s, the way to treat schizophrenia was electroconvulsive therapy, so, you know, probably wouldn't have helped much. As a matter of fact, later in this very video, we're going to see that it doesn't help much. After high school, he attended Indiana State University, but dropped out during the first semester. He returned two years later and then dropped out after one semester again, however, this time he met his wife. His wife, Juliana, and himself were married in 1971. However, for reasons that aren't really known to this day, six months after the marriage, his father placed him in a psychiatric hospital, to which he only stayed for two months. From there, he worked several odd jobs and managed to stay in one company for a total of 10 years. During this time at the company, co-workers said he was really odd. Like any time he was given a position of power, he would just yell at his co-workers and people under him, seemingly because that's what it seems like people in charge tend to do. And he was fired after 10 years at this company because he peed on a letter that was addressed to the governor of Indiana. So pretty much his boss was like, hey, can you mail this for me? And he took it and then peed on it for some reason. And also a few months before that incident, someone had peed on that same boss's desk and it was never figured out who, although, you know, putting two to two together, we can kind of get an idea. I don't know why this guy has a thing for peeing on desks, but moving on. However, Herb and his wife seemed to strike gold when in 1988, they opened the Save-A-Lot thrift store. And no, it's not like the Save-A-Lot that everyone knows. This was like a smaller store in Indianapolis. 
Um, I looked it up because I thought so too. And using the money, Herb and his wife bought a rather large Tudor mansion in northern Indianapolis. This property was a large horse farm, which was beautiful at the time of their buying it. However, because of their lifestyle, it quickly deteriorated. See, at the time that they bought it, Herb and Juliana had opened up three different thrift stores across Indianapolis, and they were making a lot of money. However, they poured all of their time into that and didn't really care about the house. It seems that they kind of bought the house as a status symbol, but they allowed weeds to overgrow it and they didn't take care of the farm at all and the inside of the house had paint chipping and boxes everywhere. However, one part of the house her really cared about for a reason that will be explained in a minute, but there was a pool house around the pool that was in the backyard and he took care of the pool as well as made the pool house into like this lavish bar that he always kept stocked. And then most bizarrely, he bought a bunch of mannequins and set them up around the pool house to make it look like there was a party. So his entire house is in shambles, but he's got like this pool bar and mannequins everywhere and music playing all the time. His wife later said that she would be inside by herself and she'd look out the window and he'd just be drinking and crying in the midst of all these mannequins. Other than whatever that's all about, things seemed relatively normal for Herb and Juliana until in 1994, their son found a skeleton on the property at the house. So the son tells Juliana, who then tells Herb, and Herb's father was an anesthesiologist, so he told Juliana, oh, that's one of the bodies that my dad used for his old experiments even though that's not at all how anesthesiologists work. So he tells her this and she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> Around this same time, there were reports of several men going missing from gay bars throughout the city of Indianapolis. What came out later is that during this period of time, whenever they were owning the Save-A-Lot stores and even before whenever he was holding the position for 10 years, Herb would go out at night when he said he was working late and go to gay bars in which he would hook up with guys. And then considering that he's on this list, you can establish what he did after that happened. A private investigator was trying to figure out where all of these missing people were going, and at the same time, there was a large investigation into the I-70 murders, or in other words, a series of bodies that were found dumped along the I-70 interstate. This private investigator eventually met a man who went by the alias of Tony, who said that one night he was at a gay bar and met a man by the name of Brian Smart. This was deep enough into the disappearances that every bar in town had posters of the missing people who Herb had, you know, unalived. This guy Tony was at a bar and he saw this man who went by Brian Smart looking very intently at that poster and Tony put together that this Brian guy knows more than he's letting on about whoever's on this poster. So Tony goes up to him, they get to talking, and eventually Brian invites him back to his house. Which Tony lucked out. This is like a foolproof way of getting murdered normally. But anyway, he gets in the car with Brian, and Brian drives them to a large Tudor-style mansion in northern Indianapolis, to which the entire inside of the house was in disrepair. But whenever they got to the pool house... It was perfectly clean and there were mannequins everywhere. So as part of whatever they were doing, Brian choked Tony and Tony pretended to pass out. And while he was pretending to pass out, Brian just stood up and like was carrying himself normally. And then whenever Tony woke back up, he was like, oh, I'm sorry, are you okay? And considering it was later found out that several of the murders occurred due to strangling, it seems that he thought he killed Tony here. So Tony takes all this to the private investigator and they do a whole search, but they can't turn anything up because they don't know that Herb is known for having his mannequin pool parties. That Tony guy was at another bar to which he saw Brian Smart walk in. Tony, remembering what this Brian guy did to him, goes out and gets the license plate number of the car that Brian drove. He takes that to the private investigator, and sure enough, they get the name of Herb Bowmeister. So finally, in 1996, the police were able to take this information to Juliana, who was pretty done with Herb's BS at the time, and she consented to a search of the property, to which while investigating, 
the police found 5,500 bone fragments in the backyard. And that doesn't mean he killed 5,500 people. It seems that what he would do after the body had decomposed a certain degree was he would just mash up the bones and then scatter them with the pebbles in the backyard. So you could be looking at what you think is just like, you know, a pebble or stone backyard garden when in actuality it's like half bones. From these fragments it was determined that he had buried at least 11 people in the backyard. Furthermore, they were able to connect him with several of the bodies that were found off the I-70 interstate. This has led many to this day to theorize that Herb Baumeister was the unidentified I-70 killer. It seems that what happened is whenever he was living in an apartment, he would dump bodies off the side of I-70, but once he got this big house, he was able to store them on the property. Although none of that will be confirmed because that same year in 1996, whenever the news went public with the information of all the bodies found on the property, Herb pulled into a park to which he then pulled out a gun and committed the end game. So, you know, while information can only be speculated on, I'm going to take the stretch and say that he was probably most definitely the I-70 killer. Carl Denke, D Denke, Carl Denke, I'm just going to call him Carl. Carl was born on August the 12th in 1860 in what was at the time the Kingdom of Prussia. According to his parents, he never really spoke to anyone until he was seven years old. And then as soon as he could begin to speak, he just started running away from home. There isn't a ton known about his childhood because again, it was the 1860s, but from this we can kind of piece together that he didn't seem like a social or very friendly type of person. However, this would completely flip when he got older as he became a rather well-renowned figure in his small community. He was often referred to as Papa Denke or Vater Denke, which is Father Denke, because he would play the organ for the local church. He also worked in the local market where he was known for selling goat meat. However, for whatever reason, on February the 21st of 1903, it seems he committed his first murder. At the time, a young girl from the town had just gone missing, but it was later figured out that she was in fact killed by Carl. From there, it seemed that nearly all of his killings were just victims of opportunity, so people like homeless or vagabonds and people that society wouldn't really notice if they went missing. And because he was never suspected of it, there's not a lot of information about what took place during these killings. However, it would all come to life on December 20th of 1924, 21 years after the first murder, in which Carl had invited a young boy into his house to help him write a letter. And while now we're like, ah, oh, stranger danger and all that, you gotta realize this guy was kind of like a Santa Claus figure in town. So if he opens up his apartment door in the middle of town and says, young man, can you help me write this letter I can't see very well, of course the kid's gonna help. To which this young boy comes in and begins writing, to which Carl says the first line dictated to him is, Adolf, you fatty. This made the boy laugh, to which when he laughed, he bent forward and turned his head, to which at the same time, Carl was swinging an axe at him. It seemed that what was happening is Carl was going to have the boy start writing a line, and as soon as he's a little bit distracted, he was just going to give him the old Jack Nicholson. But because of the laugh, he turned, and instead of going straight into the top of his head, the axe grazed the side of his face. The boy ran out into the street clutching his face, and whenever a cop ran up to see what was wrong, the only thing the boy said before he passed out was Papa Denke. The police arrest Carl because, you know, he's got the bloody axe and all. To which Carl said that he was alone in his house, and he heard someone break in, to which he just took the axe and swung it and didn't see who it was. So while the police say, alright, we'll have a trial and we'll figure all this out, they put him in a holding cell in the jail, and two days later, he hanged himself. This seemed a little dramatic to the police at the time, who thought that this was all some, like, misunderstanding in a self-defense case, because then the defendant is now hanging from the jail cell, so they do a search of his house and uncover what had really been going on. In the house were various cuts of meat, in which parts of people were cut in a similar way one would an animal, as well as various bones of people stashed in trash bins and in containers around the house. Even things as far as pickled meat and sausage packings and different things that implied he was testing different ways to eat people. In total, there was a confirmed 31 bodies found within the house. 
Although, after police did all the math and put together all the disappearances from the area that could be related to him, it's believed the actual number is probably above 42. Carl also sold shoelaces that he said were made out of horsehair. However, after all this went down, they actually tested the horsehair and it wasn't horsehair, it was people hair. And remember that whole meat shop that I mentioned earlier? Um, while this can't be confirmed, it is widely believed, or at least theorized in the area, that uh, that wasn't goat meat, or at least not entirely. See, Carl owned an entire butcher shop in which he could process all the meat, so it seems he would take his victims because, you know, the shop was attached to his house, and, you know, just throw it in there with the rest. Because of this, Carl Denke is known in history as the Zybic Cannibal. Todd Kolhep was born on March the 7th, 1971, in Florida. His parents divorced when Todd was only two years old, and his mom remarried someone who Todd later said was an abusive stepfather. However, for the sake of clarity, Todd also lied about a ton of people throughout his life, and no one else had said that the stepfather was abusive, so take that with a grain of salt. At a young age, he began demonstrating very worrying behavior whenever he began abusing animals. He walked around his neighborhood shooting dogs with BB guns, and whenever his mom said that he couldn't have a new pet because he currently had a pet goldfish, he poured bleach in the goldfish's tank. That then escalated when, again, he was eight or nine years old at the time, a girl at school said she wouldn't go out with him, so he stabbed her in the leg with a pair of scissors. Because of this, he spent three and a half months in a psychiatric hospital, to which he was diagnosed with aggressive tendencies. Really. <laughs> However, this would reach a full head when, in 1986, at only 15 years old, he kidnapped and a 14-year-old girl he went to school with. He broke into her house, held a gun to her head, tied her up, brought her home, did the deed, and then on the way back to her house to which he walked her home, he said the whole way there that if she ever told anyone, he would kill her entire family. That girl immediately told her parents and the police, to which Todd was arrested and thrown in jail for 15 years. During this time, he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, as well as an IQ of 118. There's also a statement that stuck out to me in research. During this entire trial, his parole officer was writing about his feelings regarding Todd, to which the parole officer says, although bright, he's always angry, and it seems that he feels the world owes him something. Considering that he was a minor whenever he committed the crime, he got out after 15 years in 2001, and did surprisingly well for himself. In 2006, he opened a real estate firm, and by 2008, he had graduated college with two majors in computer science and business. And according to a lot of people that worked with him, he was very smart and friendly most of the time. However, he had a tendency for aggressive outbursts, again, duh, but he also had some really strange behavioral problems, one of which being in at work with all of his co-workers around, he would regularly watch adult videos on the internet like full blast full volume um as well as he would always bring up innuendos into any conversation regardless of how appropriate it was so most people around him just assumed he was a pervy guy however the truth was again he's on this iceberg much worse everything that i'm about to say wasn't figured out until years later but i figured i'd go ahead and tell you now to kind of establish the pattern that was happening on november 6th in 2003 four people were found shot to death in a motorsport store. According to Todd's mother, what had happened is Todd went there to buy a motorcycle and then came back later because he said that he didn't know how to ride it and wanted a refund. According to Todd, the people who worked at the motorsport store laughed at him and wouldn't give him a refund because all that he was doing was he didn't know how to get on the bike. He got offended by this and shortly after came back to the motorsports store with a gun and shot the four employees who were there at the time. And according to Todd's mother, he simply killed them because they had embarrassed him. In December of 2015, he had a couple come to work on one of the properties that he managed, to which he murdered both of them. The mother said later that he had killed them because, quote, the guy had a smart mouth. So during this time, what everyone else thought were just aggressive outbursts, were so bad if anyone remotely offended him in any way, he'd just kill him. 
This came to a head when on August 31st of 2016, another couple had been hired to work on one of Todd's properties and went missing. However, at the time, no one knew that they had been hired to go work on Todd's property, so they were missing for a couple months. That was until a post was made from one of the missing couple's Facebook accounts that said the two of them had simply ran away and gotten married and no one should come looking for them. The police used satellite tracking to determine where the post was made from, and sure enough, it was the middle of one of Todd's properties. Whenever the police came to search, they heard a loud banging noise coming from within a shipping container, to which when they opened it, they found a woman inside and chained up. She revealed that her and her boyfriend she was with at the time did in fact go to work on Todd's property. However, Todd got mad, killed the boyfriend, and then had been keeping her locked up in a shipping container. And after Todd was caught for this, the previous murders that I mentioned came to light. However, the most notorious fact about Todd comes from his nickname, the Amazon Review Killer. The reason for this is because he had an account on Amazon that was simply the name me. And using that account, Todd would leave very creepy reviews for various products on Amazon. He also reviewed a ton of stuff too, like he just spent his free time leaving reviews for like DVD collections or pet feeders or whatever. However, some of them were very sinister, like for example, a combination lock that he left a review on saying that he's got five of them and they do a great job at keeping a woman locked up and she won't be able to get out because of it. As well as a taser, that he said does a fantastic job at torturing people he holds captive, and a shovel that he said did a fantastic job at quickly hiding bodies whenever he needs to dispose of evidence. And just to add another layer of disturbingness to it, a lot of these comments would, you know, be starred or whatever because people thought it was funny because obviously most people just assumed it to be a joke. However, it turns out it was not a joke at all. Todd said later that he had killed several more people because, again, he just had aggressive outbursts and killed sporadically and was never caught for it. However, there were only seven that could be proven, so there were only seven that he was charged with. He was given a life sentence, and for one just like little spark of goodness in this entire video, in 2020, several of the properties that he owned were auctioned off, and all of the proceeds from those profits were donated to the families of the people that he had killed. So, I mean, I know it's not a lot and it's nothing to give back for it, but that's the one time in research for this I was like, well, that's a nice touch. Alexander Pachuskin was born in Russia in 1974. He was a normal kid up until he was four years old. And I know it's kind of like a joke and a meme, like brain injury as a child leads to being a serial killer later. However, there is evidence for the fact that brain injuries at a young age can lead to a loss of impulse control. And while that doesn't always, you know, equal serial killer, it doesn't help. When he was four years old, he fell off of a swing set and then set up and the swing came back down and hit him in the forehead. And this was an event that nearly killed him as a child. I don't know what kind of swings they have in Russia, but they're too much. He was very rebellious and mean-spirited as a child until his grandfather decided to teach him the game of chess. Alexander was fantastic at chess and began beating people who played in the parks around his house. That was until his grandfather passed away and seemingly heartbroken, Alexander became very violent and alcoholic. There was also a stretch of time where he enjoyed videoing himself threatening children. And not like he videoed himself killing them or kidnapping them, at least not yet. But if he knew that there were like a bunch of children in the park, he'd leave his house with a video camera and then walk up to them and be like, hey, I'm going to hurt you, I'm going to hurt you, I'm going to hurt you, and the kids would cry and he'd laugh and that's it. There's also one video where he filmed himself grabbing a kid by the ankle and just like shaking him and saying he was going to throw him off a building. And then he would go home and watch these videos, and from everything that I read, there was no typical serial killer um, relief gained from watching these videos. It was just him like staring at the TV like, yeah. I'm a really cool guy. Eventually, in 1992, at only 18 years old, Alexander committed his first murder. As with many serial killers, the majority of these killings were on victims of opportunity like the homeless. Typically, Alexander would goad someone to follow him into the sewers or the woods or somewhere away from prying eyes 
to which he would then beat them with a hammer. There were also several wells around the town that led to like a 40 foot drop straight down into the town sewer system. And several times he would get people to come stand near the well to which he just pushed them in. Although one person actually survived this. It was believed by Russian media that he was in competition with Andrei Shikatilo. I mentioned Andrei in one of the earlier tiers of the iceberg, but Alexander decided he was going to beat him by getting 64 kills. 64 correlating to the number of spaces on a chessboard, which gave him the nickname of the chessboard killer. He was eventually caught after he had killed a woman and the police found her body. In her pocket, they found a ticket to a local train station. They went and watched the security camera from from that train station to which they could see the woman being followed by Alexander. Finally, he was arrested in 2006 to which he was convicted of 49 murders and three attempted murders. He asked the judge if he could add 11 more murders to the sentence and another attempted, bringing him to that 64 number. And everyone on this iceberg is depraved and awful and it's the worst kind of evil that exists in the world. However, Alexander's especially frustrating because he's so proud of it. He talks several times in interrogation and interviews how the reason he killed people is because he just felt the need to live and it was so thrilling and he described killing as kissing a girl and he says most people remember their first kiss, I remember my first kill and blah blah blah. And because of details like asking the judge to add 11 more murders because he thought it sounded cooler, the guy is especially hated. He was given a life sentence and the first 15 years of that sentence were required to be served in solitary confinement, to which Alexander is still in solitary confinement in Russia to this day. Juan Corona was born in Mexico in 1934. In 1950, he entered the United States with his brother and began working on several ranches and farms in the Southwest United States. Everything was fine until in 1955, a large flood hit Southern California, which was so devastating it killed 74 people. Juan and his brother were in the midst of that flood and Juan seemingly suffered a nervous breakdown. His brother sent him to a psychiatric hospital after this, to which he was diagnosed as a schizophrenic reaction paranoid type. And remember how earlier I mentioned the standard treatment at the time was to electrocute someone? Well, that's what happened. He was given 23 electroconvulsive therapies. And then after this, because he had came over the border illegally, they just deported him back to Mexico. However, he returned back to the United States legally in 1962. For several years, he was doing well for himself. His job was to essentially manage the workers on larger ranches and farms. And everything seemed to be normal until in 1971, one of the ranch owners saw Juan using equipment to dig a very large hole on his property. Juan then filled up that hole to which later the ranch owner went to check it out and found a body. He called the police and during the investigation they found several bodies as well as several of Juan's personal belongings. This gave police enough of a warrant to arrest Juan themselves to which whenever they came to his house to search it they found that he had a lot of bloody clothes as well as a gun that was later linked to one of the killings. On the property they found a total of 25 dead bodies. One of them was shot, which I mentioned earlier, however the majority of them seemed to be hacked and cut to death. At the trial for Juan, there were no defense witnesses, including Juan, ever brought forward. On January the 18th of 1973, Juan was convicted as guilty on 25 accounts of murder. While in jail, he bumped into another inmate while walking through the hallways, to which that inmate and his friends stabbed Juan 32 times and the guy lived. That's not really relevant to the whole thing, I just had to mention that. Because of complications that came out with the original trial, Juan was given a second trial in 1982, to which the defense team called Juan to the stand and asked him only two questions. Through the interpreter, they asked, do you understand that you're accused of 25 murders? To which Juan said, yes. And then the defense asked, are you guilty of them? To which Juan said, no. And then the defense turned it over to the prosecution. There were a lot of people at the time and part of the reason that a second trial was given who thought that maybe Juan being, you know, a poor immigrant was being set up by possibly the ranch owners or someone else as the fall guy for their murders. However, the most damning piece of evidence and also what got him a guilty on all counts during the second trial as well 
was a ledger book that they found on his person whenever he was originally arrested. In it, he had kept a log of everyone who came to work at the ranch in the property. Because remember, his job was to keep track of the workers on the property, as well as give them housing in several of the houses on the ranch that he managed as well. So he had this ledger that had the names of everyone who was killed, as well as a date attached to each of those names, which no one else knew. That turned out to be the day they were all murdered. So, you know, it doesn't exactly look reassuring. And in 2019, Juan died of natural causes while in prison at the age of 85. Man, I am from southern appalachia i was not made to say words like this and also there's several people who comment whenever i do that like well just look up how to pronounce it or like hear someone else pronounce it or whatever um but it's a lot funnier if i have to like bleed and fight my way through it so here we go the nepropotrovsk mani the nepropotrovsk maniacs that was close enough were an at first unknown group of serial killers who committed their first killing in Ukraine on June the 25th of 2007. It began when a woman and a homeless man were randomly beat to death in the middle of town. In the following month of July, several more people were found in the nearby area, all being beat to death with some blunt force object. The maniacs were eventually caught trying to pawn a phone from one of the people they had murdered. The police had lines in the water everywhere trying to find a different way to catch these killers, so whenever one of the murder victims had their location come on in a pawn shop, the police ran there and sure enough caught two of the maniacs. To which after short deliberation, a third one was arrested and picked up at their house. The two primary killers were two young men by the name of Victor and Igor, with a third accomplice, Alexander, being the one who was picked up from their house. And then once interrogations began and people started to put the pieces together, the picture of what had happened came to light. The three boys had grown up and gone to school with each other, and everything seemed normal until they were 14 years old. When they were 14, Igor had told Victor that he was afraid of heights, to which Victor said the best way to get over your fears is by facing them. So the two went to a high balcony and hanged themselves by their arms off of the ledge, to which they said it cured their fear of heights. The third friend, Alexander, said that he was afraid that whenever he was giving his cat a bath that he would accidentally scald it. To which the two other friends said, well, you know what the best way to get over your fear of hurting your cat is? By murdering dogs. So the boys began to gather stray dogs from the town and then brutally torture and eventually kill them. They also thought it was really funny to film all of this, to which during the videos of them killing these animals, they are very excited and making jokes and laughing at each other. They were also a big fan of your typical etchy jokes, like they would take blood and draw swat stickers with it and make Hitler jokes. They then took part of this violence to humans whenever they began robbing people at random. One of the ways they would do this is Igor, had a taxi cab that he would shuttle people around the city in. So they would load up in the taxi cab, pick up people, rob them, and then kick them out. This kept escalating to more violent robberies until eventually Igor and Victor said they were just walking down the street one day when they were holding a hammer and just decided to murder a random woman. They did and then nearby saw a homeless man sleeping on a park bench to which they just walked up and murdered him. They enjoyed this so much that they continued doing it at random in the following month and got a total count of 21 murders and 8 attempted murders. There were several times that they were almost caught, for example, they would almost have someone killed in the street before somebody would see them and begin chasing them down the road but they always managed to get away according to one of the boy's girlfriend she had said that they planned to get rich off of these videos that they were making see at first victor and igor were just doing it because they enjoyed it but then they would begin filming it and some of the videos are alleged to have been filmed by Alexander, which is why he was roped in as the third man. Even though on camera you only ever see Victor and Igor committing the killings. According to that same girlfriend, there was a quote rich foreign website owner who had commissioned the boys a ton of money to make a total of 40 snuff films. One of these videos found their way online and is now the infamous shock video 
three guys, one hammer. In the over 300 photos of various mutilations and animal mutilations that the boys had done, there was also several photos of them attending funerals and doing things like flipping off the casket and spitting on the grave of their victims. The defense's argument was that this was all a cover-up and that the actions were in fact committed by children of various high-ranking officials in Ukrainian government and that all of the pictures and videos of the boys had been faked and altered in order to throw them under the bus and clear their children's name. However, even even as outlandish as this defense was, the boys took it even farther because there was one point in the trial where the prosecution held up a picture from one of the videos of what was obviously the two boys and they said, does this look familiar? To which I believe it was Victor said no and the judge leaned over and said, you are not blind and Victor said, okay, yeah. Alexander was only ever convicted of the robberies that he took part in because remember, although it's believed he may have been holding the camera sometimes, that can't be proven and he was never seen on camera committing the killings. So Alexander was given nine years in jail while Igor and Victor were each given a life sentence. The boys, as well as their families, maintain their innocence to this day. Louis Garavito was born in Genova, Colombia in 1957. And whenever I bring up things like child abuse or what the killer experienced as a child in these stories, I'm never doing it to justify or explain away the evils that they did. Their evils that they committed speak for themselves. However, as I've said before, whenever an apple falls from a tree to create a much more evil and depraved tree, that's most often because the tree that it fell from was wrong to begin with. Evil most often begats an even worse evil. And that being said, Garavito experienced extreme abuse as a child. His dad was an alcoholic who very often beat and hurt Garavito, as well as forcing him to experience various forms of trauma. For example, Garavito's mother was forced into prostitution by his father, to which his father made Garavito watch. And at some point, his father also began prostituting Garavito himself. One of which was to a neighbor who would not only do those unspeakable actions to Garavito at a young age, but would also mutilate him with things like razors and barbed wire. Around the age of 13 or 14, Garavito began acting out by killing small animals and then performing those actions that had been performed on him to other small children. At the age of 16, he ran away and for several years was an alcoholic, constantly staying in and out of psychiatric hospitals. However, during this time, there was at least one attempt to end his own life, as well as various stints of him torturing children in ways that he had been tortured. At one point, he got very into the esoteric and the occult and decided that he was going to become a Satanist who performed blood rituals to Satan himself. He committed his first murder on October the 2nd of 1995. He committed his first murder on October the 2nd of 1992 when he was 35 years old. I, I've talked about a lot of like bad guys up until this point, right? And I kind of had it in the back of my head like as we get near the end of the iceberg, it's gotta get worse. And like I've, I've seen all the shock videos and live leaks and all that stuff, but there's a, a special evil to cases like this. And also out of respect for the victims, because whenever someone endures horrors like this, I don't want to profit off of it. And I don't want to make a spectacle of the things that they went through because you all are gracious enough to watch this video and to support me as I try to give a look at some of the more insane stories of the human condition and things that I find to be interesting if also disturbing. And I don't want to turn it into a circus of, oh, well, look what this person went through and this person went through. But also, because with cases like this, I wish there were some things that were still unspeakable. I mentioned earlier that he would do it as a sort of blood ritual, believing himself to be giving sacrifices to Satan, but he performed every possible level of anger and hatred and evil towards these children that you could really imagine. To give you an idea, whenever the bodies were first discovered, they thought that it was the work of large groups of wild man-eating animals until they did the autopsy and saw that there were injuries and damage to the body that an animal wouldn't commit or couldn't commit. Then they said that it was the work of a huge cult. 
Garavito would almost always disguise himself. Some of the disguises he would use are that of a priest, that of a school teacher or a police officer, in order to get young children to follow him somewhere. All of his victims were of the ages of 6 to 13 years old. Save for one victim, who was a 16 year old who was crippled, and five adults who he murdered seemingly because they were witnesses to the crimes he was already committing. He would get these children to follow him for long distances to the outskirts of town, because at that point they were tired and couldn't fight back, as well as away from public eye, to which he would perform these horrendous actions, sometimes over the course of several hours. Several of these disappearances and murders had gone unreported, so the police weren't really aware of him. That was until in 1997, they began finding mass graves of children. Up to 41 children buried within these graves at a time. And as I mentioned before, the police thought they were on a lookout for this mass group of serial killers. However, they began to be set on his trail because after one of these murders occurred, he got so drunk that he fell asleep while holding a lit lighter in the middle of a field and ended up setting the field on fire. After the fire was put out, the police investigated, to which they found three bodies of the children he had just murdered, and it seemed that Garavito had left in such a hurry that he left his glasses, his shoes, and a piece of paper with an address on it. Garavito had a very rare eye condition, to which those glasses were specifically made for that eye condition, and he also walked with a limp, to which the shoes were made one larger than the other to compensate for that limp. The address was to a woman's house who it turns out was one of Garavito's girlfriends. He said later in interviews that he was never attracted or had any physical engagements with these women that he stayed with, which there were several it turned out, but he more so just manipulated and used them so he could have a place to stay. Whenever the police went to the address, the woman said that Garavito hadn't been by in a really long time, but that he had left his bag there, so she just gave it to the police. In the bag was a notebook detailing several of his killings, as well as giving specific times and dates that also tied him to those killings. Garavito was finally arrested after this, whenever he tried to murder another child, and a 16-year-old kid saw him doing it, ran over and hit Garavito, and the two boys ran away, to which they began screaming and Garavito chased them through the woods. To which the police came and caught him, quite literally, chasing two young boys through the woods. To which when he was caught, Garavito claimed that he was a local politician. This obviously didn't work because Garavito was in Colombia, and as we all know, the only place that you can get away with being a child molester because you're a politician is the United States to which he was arrested on April the 22nd of 1999. Not only did the notebook connect the two, but his DNA matched the DNA found at various crime scenes, and Garavito eventually broke down and confessed to the murders, to which Garavito was charged with murdering 172 children, to which he was found guilty of 138 of those murders. I should also mention in that the year since that he's been in jail, he has been given maps to which he was told to draw out where the killings took place, and if he is to be believed, he has committed over 400 child murders. Columbia doesn't have a death penalty, so he was given an individual charge for each of the murders, to which his total sentence is 1,853 years and 9 days. However, because of some really dumb case of Colombian law, the max that anyone can ever get is 40 years. And also, because he cooperated with the police and showed them the location of missing children's bodies, he was only set to serve 22 years. So because of all these technicalities, the guy who potentially murdered over 400 children and was sentenced to 11 centuries in prison was only set to serve 22 years, which means he is up for parole and release in 2023, to which he says he's currently studying to become a priest and enter the ministry or become a politician so that he can help endangered children in need. And not to get political on this channel, but no. The nickname this guy was given by the media is The Beast, and local media has called him the worst serial killer to ever live. And like, when combining his actions and what he did to these children, as well as the fact of the sheer number of ones he did it to, 
I mean, yeah, he's definitely in the running for it. And to have whatever dumb laws exist down there mean after 22 years and literally hundreds of lives ended, he can now get out and become a part of the church or a politician. I am absolutely furious at that. Like reading all of this stuff and then, cause you know, I read it, like I research it chronologically. So the whole time I'm like, man, I hope this guy's dead <laughs> or thrown under a jail or something rather. And then see a media outlet be like, oh, well, you know, he's going to help endanger children. Like, and you know, I try to like, keep spirits up on this channel and you know not let things get me down all the time but man stuff like that is depressing beginning with nikolai zumagalev also known as metal fang what better way to end the iceberg than with someone who has a name that is way cooler than they deserve Nikolai was born on November the 15th of 1952, and by all accounts had a normal childhood as he was growing up. He was born into the USSR in a region that is today part of Kazakhstan. Because of this, he did his mandatory military service, but even then didn't show any distinct signs of aggression. The closest thing is that there are several mentions of him being in bar fights, but for most Russian soldiers at the time, that was kind of part of the job description. And after his military service, he maintained several blue collar jobs and was a well respected member of the community. He got the nickname Metal Fang because during one of these fights, he knocked out his front two teeth, which he replaced with white metal ones. What seemed to be the turning point for him was on one occasion after sleeping with someone from his local town, he contracted trichomoniasis and syphilis. It seems because of this, he grew an intense hatred of women. This would culminate during his first killing in January of 1979. Nikolai found a woman walking by herself on a back road which connected two different towns, to which he snuck up behind her, dragged her into the woods, and killed her. Shortly after the killing, a bus pulled up and stopped nearby on the road, so Nikolai quit moving in order to avoid detection, however he got really cold and used the body for warmth. Perhaps the most brutal aspect of the killing is that after this event, he began to drink blood from his victim as well as take parts of her home to which he later cooked and ate. He seemingly developed a taste for it and would continue this action several times afterwards. Later that same year, he was working as a fireman and while drunk, accidentally shot and killed another fireman. Keep in mind, the police and courts had no idea about his serial killings at this point, so he was tried for just the accidental shooting. During this time, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and he was ultimately let off as it was ruled a total accident. Shortly after this, he began having friends over to his house for cookouts, to which it was later found out he would regularly feed them human body parts, while claiming that it was just meat from an animal he had hunted. He became so bold with this that one day during one of his parties, he got one of his friend's girlfriends to come into the bathroom with him, to which he then killed her with an ax, and during the process, another one of the party attendees saw this, he screamed, everyone ran away and contacted the police, to which whenever the police got there, he was standing there completely naked, continuing to cut up the body as if nothing had happened. And then somehow, probably because the police were so freaked out by this sight, he got away and managed to stay unapprehended for 24 hours. And I can't emphasize that enough. The police walk in, he's standing there naked, covered in blood, he runs outside, and they just couldn't catch him for a while. The next day, he was caught, however, while staying at his cousin's house. And later that year, in 1981, he was found not guilty by reason of mental insanity. So for eight years, he stayed in a home for the mentally ill. That was until he was being transferred by a caseworker in 1989, to which at some point, Nikolai managed to steal the vehicle and get away. And from that point, he just drove the car to the mountains of Kazakhstan and began hiding out there. There was one point, however, where he felt like the authorities were closing in on the manhunt with him, so he contacted one of his friends in Moscow and had him write a fake letter to Nikolai's family saying that Nikolai was currently in Moscow and he'd begin killing there. This actually worked and the police, thinking that Nikolai is about to start a murder spree in Moscow, focused all of their efforts back there. Nikolai lived in hiding for a couple years, even at one point growing medicinal herbs and trading them with villagers. However, by 1991, he was tired of it all and decided that the best way to start his life over was to get arrested for a 
minor crime under a fake name, that way when he got out he could reintegrate to society with a seemingly workable alibi. To do this, he stole sheep and then was purposefully caught while doing it. However, whenever he was being interrogated by the police and he gave them a story that he was an immigrant from China who was just stealing sheep because he was poor, he couldn't give an answer for how he successfully got over the border and into the country. Because of this discrepancy, the interrogators invited detectives from Moscow to come help figure out what the issue was. And sure enough, the detective from Moscow who showed up to question this supposed random Chinese sheep thief was one of the detectives who was originally looking for Nikolai during the killings. Which that had to be weird for the detective, like, imagine you've spent years looking for this serial killer with metal teeth in the middle of Moscow, and then you get a call about some sheep thief in the Ural Mountains, and whenever you get out there, it's the metal tooth cannibal guy. So now that he was caught under the correct name, he was again sentenced to a life sentence because, again, no death penalty because he was ruled mentally deficient. He was thrown back into a home and continues to live out that life sentence today. However, he frequently makes requests that they give him the death penalty, although to this date, all of them have been denied. While Nikolai was only ever officially convicted of five murders, it's believed the actual number is closer to a dozen. Metal Fang really caught on with the media, especially considering the cannibalistic nature of these killings and you know a crazed Russian in the mountains who eats people with metal teeth is something that I'm sure the news like to run with. Benjamin Adkins was born on August 26th of 1968 in Detroit, Michigan. I have to mention this even though I have no idea what it's talking about but every source I read about Benjamin said he ran away in 1970 at the age of two. I don't know how a two-year-old runs away from home but I think I should mention that that is a thing that happened. Because of this running or crawling away or whatever happened, Benjamin was taken in by an orphanage. It was found out by caseworkers after this event that he never knew his father and his mother was a heavy drug user. Because of this dynamic, Benjamin was constantly in and out of foster care and in and out of his mother's care. However, things got complicated when Benjamin was only 10 years old and he was abused by one of the workers at the orphanage. This made the courts rule that his mother was the better option to take him given the circumstances. However, that turned out to be not good either. Benjamin's mother was a prostitute and would often bring Benjamin on her jobs and Benjamin later recalled frequently being in the back seat while she worked in the front seat. This gave Benjamin a very intense hatred of women and especially those who worked as prostitutes within Detroit. As he grew up he was never really able to maintain any job for a long amount of time and became a crack addict mostly living in abandoned buildings around Detroit. One day Benjamin invited a woman who was working outside of the abandoned building that he was staying in he invited her inside so that the two get a kid high, but whenever she tried to leave, he killed her. And from there, that was established as his regular M.O. He would lure women who he saw as undesirable into abandoned buildings, killed them, and then most often left their buildings in that location. As a matter of fact, the buildings were so often looked over that it wasn't until months later police began to realize that there was a killer on the loose. During this series of murders, Benjamin was actually interrogated by the police early on. However, he had an alibi and wasn't considered a top suspect anymore. During his killings, there was one woman who he attempted to murder who managed to fight back enough that she got away. From that point on, anytime the police thought that they had someone who may be the killer, they would bring her in in order to ID him. So for several months, this woman would show up, say, no, that's not the guy, and that was just the routine. Until one day, Benjamin was arrested for a totally unrelated assault charge. However, this assault occurred in the area of one of the recent killings, so while the police were interrogating him, they had the surviving victim come, and sure enough, she ID'd him. After over 12 hours of interrogation, Benjamin eventually confessed to the 11 murders. And from there, it was later proven through things like DNA evidence and his recollection of the killings that he was, in fact, the killer. According to him, the first murder was accidental and due to the effects of the drugs he was taking. However, after that, he decided that he enjoyed it and continued to do it again. Perhaps one of the most brutal details of this is that his method of murder was strangulation, and he would often have them pass out 
and then wait for them to wake back up just so he could do it again. In April of 1994, he was convicted of 11 murders taking place over the span of nine months. And for these 11 murders, he was given 11 life sentences. Benjamin died of an illness while in prison on September 17th of 1997, and to this day is known as the Woodward Corridor Killer. Robert Hansen, also known as the Butcher Baker, was born in Iowa in 1939. From a young age, Robert's strict dad made him work long hours in the family bakery, and Robert himself was bullied in school for having a speech impediment. He joined the Army Reserve out of high school, and it was during this time that he was renowned for his marksmanship. However, in 1960, he was arrested after burning down the school bus garage. In the court proceedings that followed, he was diagnosed as having an infantile personality. Because of his reputation in Iowa growing sour, he moved to Alaska in 1967, to which initially it seemed that life was going good for him. He had a wife and kids and was a professional big game hunter within Anchorage, Alaska. As a matter of fact, he held several state records for large game hunts he went on. However, a couple years after arriving there, he was arrested and served six months in jail for attacking a prostitute, and in 1977 was arrested for stealing a chainsaw for some reason. In 1980, he staged a false robbery at his house in which he said several items were stolen and using the insurance payout money, he opened his own bakery in Anchorage, Alaska. And two years later, bought his own bush plane to explore the Alaskan wilderness. What was not known until years later is that during this stretch of time, Robert would go into the city and pick up prostitutes before bringing them to his private plane and flying to a small shack that he had in the middle of the Alaskan wilderness. Once there, he would demand them to perform several odd fantasies to which for 30 women who performed those fantasies, he brought them back and they just assumed him to be a weird rich client. However, for at least 17 women who refused his advances, it became much darker. To, again, at least 17 victims after forcing himself onto them after they denied his advances, he would then release them into the Alaskan wilderness to which he would then hunt them down over the next several days. In later interviews, it was shown that he would hunt them in much the way he would an animal, tracking them and stalking them through the forest. Initially, when women were found shot to death in the middle of the wilderness, the police who found their bodies thought that this was the result of some sort of gang dumping people that they killed in the middle of the wilderness. This may have went on for much longer if it wasn't for one woman who escaped in 1983. A trucker was driving down the road near Anchorage, Alaska, when he saw a woman run out of the woods with one hand handcuffed. He brought her to the police to which she said she was working on the corner whenever a John Doe pulled up, invited her into the car. He then drove her to his house before she denied his advances. He had his way before taking her to the airport and before flying away, she managed to catch him off guard for a second and run away. And somehow, by the grace of God, she remembered the tail number of the plane he tried to take her in. So the police searched the number and came to the name of Robert Hansen. Initially, his friends gave a false alibi for him, which they later recanted on, and after a lot of court hoopla, he was eventually arrested and his house searched. In his possession, they found a Ruger Mini-14, which ballistically matched the 223 bullets that were used to kill the women, as well as several souvenirs such as IDs, driver's license, or purses from the women that he had killed. He was suspected of 21 murders and after a plea bargain that ensured he wouldn't get the death penalty, he showed investigators 17 of them. However, for whatever reason, he never showed the other four, even though he confessed to those four killings. The most common theory around this, which again can't really be proven, is that perhaps those four that he killed weren't prostitutes, and therefore in his own twisted form of morality, he had more trouble justifying it and didn't want to confront it. Finally, on February the 18th, 1984, he was sentenced to a life sentence plus 461 years in prison, to which he died of natural causes while in prison on May the 11th of 2014. Ervil LeBaron was born on February 22nd of 1925 in Chihuahua, Mexico. He was born into a fanatical Mormon family who had started a compound within Mexico. To give a little bit of background because it matters for this story, in 1890, the Mormon church officially made 
polygamy illegal within its organization. In other words, if you wanted to be a Mormon or part of the main body, of the Mormon community, you couldn't take part in polygamy. There's this stigma around Mormons that kind of say that polygamy is just what all of them do and it's like the main tenet of it, but as a matter of fact, it's shunned a lot and polygamy is absolutely the exception rather than the rule. However, because of that ban, polygamists who still believe that polygamy should be a part of the religion began to branch off and started their own compounds. Ervil's father took a group of about 30 families to Mexico and started his own group there. Ervil being raised in this environment definitely had a profound effect on him, so much so that whenever his father died and his older brother Joel was given control of the church and therefore the people within it, it made Ervil jealous. In protest, Ervil broke off and started his own church known as the Church of the Firstborn of the Lamb of God. That has three ofs in it. And while running this church, he ordered his followers to kill his brother Joel. To which they did, and Ervil's other brother took over that church, to which Ervil tried to have that brother killed too. So in 1974, he was arrested because it came out that he had his brother assassinated, essentially. However, after he was convicted of the murder of his brother, he was released on a technicality, although it's widely believed that he paid off the court. To which the group of followers that he had amassed were so devoted that whenever he was convicted and arrested, his followers began tearing up towns and trying to get him out of prison, and people died in the ensuing chaos, and it was a whole mess. After being released, Ervil carried out several killings on other polygamists who opposed his particular ideas. See, the way it essentially worked after the breakup of the polygamous sect from the normal sect of the Mormon religion is all of this polygamous groups went and started their own groups around the southern United States and northern Mexico. So while having core tenant beliefs, they were separate on their communication and the way they interacted with each other. So several of these different families or churches essentially had problems with Ervil seeing him as being too radical and if any of them were too vocal about it, Ervil would have them killed. Of course, Ervil was too much of a coward to put his own neck out there, so instead he often had one of his several wives or his several daughters carry out the murders themselves. After this, it's believed that he began killing members of his own family who opposed or tried to leave the church. However, this can't be confirmed because everyone at the time was way too hush-hush about it. Not only did Ervil kill these people because they disagreed with him, but he also preached a doctrine known as blood atonement, which similar to polygamy is a very old and outdated idea within Mormon religion that isn't practiced anymore. However, again, like polygamy, Ervil was a big fan of it. The idea behind blood atonement is that some people are so sinful that the only way they could get into heaven is that they had to make themselves a blood sacrifice unto God and then that is showing that you're sorry enough that God will let you into heaven. So not only was this so frustratingly evil because he just had people he didn't like murdered, he would get his followers to do it because it was the right thing for that person. In other words, if you want a bunch of your daughters or wives to kill another one of your daughters, you just go to him and say, oh man, like our daughter is being so sinful and awful, she's going to hell. Unless we murder her, then she can get into heaven. Finally, on June the 1st of 1979, Ervil was arrested for killing a leader of another polygamous church. However, while in prison, he wrote a new Bible that gave his followers in over 400 pages a detailed description of why they should kill people that are sinful, as well as a hit list of who to murder. Ervil died a year after his arrest of a heart attack while he was in prison, however that doesn't mean the murder stopped because of the aforementioned Bible. It's been estimated that since his death, 25 people have been murdered as a direct response to his teachings. Perhaps most notably were the 4 o'clock murders in Houston, where at 4 o'clock in the day, Four different people were murdered around the city who had publicly opposed Ervil in life. And these hits occurred as drive-bys of people coming up to other people with guns in the middle of the city and shooting them. And while it seems like now the killings have stopped, again, 25 people who he listed in that book ended up being murdered. And because of that and all of the killings that he committed before, again, all at the hands of somebody else, 
In total, it's estimated that Erval LeBaron killed, at the very least, about 35 people. John Haig was born on July the 24th, 1909, in Lincolnshire to a very Protestant and conservative family. Most likely due to the strict religious upbringing that he had, at a young age John said that he had several nightmares regarding religion. However, the one thing that he maintained from his parents' teachings was a love of the piano and a fondness for playing it. He would use this knowledge of the piano in order to gain access to more high-ranking members of society within London and other areas in the United Kingdom. And then from there, he would begin his life as a con artist. In his younger days, John was constantly in and out of jail for things like theft and fraud. And in 1936, he was arrested for selling fake stocks to high members of London society and decided that the best way to go about his future endeavors was to make sure that no one was alive to testify against him. However, he didn't want to get caught for this and had heard about a recently caught serial killer in France who dissolved his victim's bodies in sulfuric acid. So he decided to test this by killing mice and dropping them in vats of acid to see how long it took them to dissolve. After seeing it took mice about 30 minutes to completely disappear, he decided humans would probably take a couple days and that would serve as a good way for him to get rid of evidence. So when in 1943 he met his old employer who he quickly became jealous of, he decided now is as good of time as any to act out his plan. His old employer worked for his own parents by managing their properties and selling and renting properties throughout London. John managed to develop a good repertoire with his old employer as well as his parents and then one day lured John into a sub basement beneath a property in London to which John then killed him by beating him over the head. He then took his body and placed it in a 40 gallon drum of sulfuric acid. After a couple days once it had melted, he dragged the barrel out to a manhole in the streets of London and then poured away the evidence. John told his former employer's parents that their son had ran away because he didn't want to join the military. This kind of sort of made sense since it was in the middle of World War II. However, it also didn't because, you know, guys like rich London realtors don't really have to join the military. But that excuse worked long enough for John to be hired in place of their son until their son comes back. After about a year of John getting rich selling properties, his parents started to ask a lot of questions about like, why haven't we heard from him? Why is he only talking to you? This is weird. Until one day, John said that their son was back in town and wanted to meet them. And all they had to do was follow John into a basement beneath this property. And yeah, he did the whole acid thing again. Despite having murdered now three members of this family and stealing a lot of their wealth, he managed to gamble away almost all of it by 1940. He then met a rich couple known as the Hendersons, who he impressed with his piano knowledge and ability to play. And after becoming quick friends, he invited the husband over to his workshop that he was renting at the time, telling him that he had just invented a brand new invention. Whenever the husband, Mr. Henderson, walked into the workshop, John pulled out a revolver that he had previously stolen from Mr. Henderson and shot and killed him. He then went to the Henderson household and told Mr. Henderson's wife, Mrs. Henderson, that Mr. Henderson was very sick and she needed to come to his workshop right away. And whenever she got there, he killed her and then put both of their bodies in the acid. After liquidating a lot of their funds through means that weren't detectable by authorities, he managed to make about 8,000 pounds while keeping the Henderson's car and dog. But he decided that money wasn't enough, and between that and a combination of him gambling it away, he decided to kill again in 1949, whenever he had a rich widow come into that same shop, to which he did the acid thing again. However, this time one of the rich widow's friends, who knew she had went to visit this workshop, alerted police. And after the police got there and saw her expensive coat, they decided to search the property, to which out back at the edge of the property, they found various human remains on a trash pile. See, whenever John killed the first three people, it was in the middle of London and there were manholes everywhere and he could just dump it down into the drains. However, at this new place he was renting, there wasn't any form of that. So he had to dump the sulfuric soup mix at the edge of the property because there was nowhere else to store it. To which police found things that did not melt in the sulfuric acid, including human gallstones as well as the widow's pair of dentures. John was arrested for this and, while being interrogated, asked the question of if it was possible to ever be released from a mental asylum 
and the interrogator was confused and was like, what are you talking about? And from that moment on, John just pretended to be crazy. He confessed to all six murders, as well as saying there were three more, however, this was never proven. And during the entire trial, made a fool of himself, saying that he was a vampire that drinks blood, and he had visions of, like, God telling him he had to kill people, and he, he tried, like, the whole crazy killer thing. However, considering the amount of care and again, the whole acid thing, that shows pretty good evidence that he was in his right mind when he did these killings. And John was hanged on August the 10th of 1949 and is known in history as the London Acid Bath Killer. Adolfo Constanzo was born in Miami in 1962. He was born to an only mother who raised him in church, and as a matter of fact, Adolfo grew up as an altar boy. Things seemed normal until Adolfo was 10 years old and began to apprentice under someone who was an expert at Pelo Mayombe. This is a religious practice that, in my research, seems similar to voodoo, at least in its traditional roots, and while all of that isn't necessary to the video, what is necessary to the video is that the practice of this religion, at least at the time, involves animal sacrifice. Adolfo began to succeed in this market and become very interested in it, so much so that when he grew up, he moved to Mexico City and started a business that was just dedicated to performing spells and rituals for clientele. And considering that all of his spells and rituals required some level of killing animals, the majority of people who sought out his servants were cartel members and hitmen. As demand grew higher, Aldolfo continued to amp up the magnitude of these killings. Initially, beginning with things like rats, he eventually amped up to the point that he was performing sacrifices with lions. However, as you can imagine, he eventually began telling cartel members that in order to perform accurate rituals, he would need human body parts. There were several bodies found around Mexico City during this time that would have entire pieces of their body missing, to which it was found out years later that these were victims of, if not Aldolfo, members of the cartel who were supplying Aldolfo with the body parts he needed. During this time, people who watched Aldolfo were so convinced that he was a true spiritual expert and had the abilities of the supernatural that they began to favor his leadership over that of several cartel families. So much so that when one cartel family rejected the amount of money he demanded for a sacrifice, he had his now devoted cult followers go attack that cartel family to which seven members of the family themselves were used in his rituals. So this guy went from being essentially a performance or person of interest for the cartel to now directly declaring war against their members. He began a compound in the outskirts of Mexico City where he would keep these body parts and perform these rituals as well as beginning his own cartel ring, moving things like cocaine and marijuana. So not to talk about Mexican politics because frankly I'm not an expert on it, however it's kind of common knowledge that the police don't really mess with the cartel too much because they're seen as being so powerful. And for a long time the authorities just assumed that Aldolfo was just another branch of the cartel. That was until an American student who was vacationing in Mexico from Texas was kidnapped by Aldolfo, and then it was later found out that his brain was used in a ritual. Because of pressure from the United States, and more specifically Texas, who said that if Mexico didn't do the investigation, America would, Mexican authorities raided Aldolfo's compound, to which whenever entering, they found a giant vat that was burning in the middle of the room, with several human bones and then a brain placed in the middle of it. And upon searching the grounds around the property, they found an additional 15 bodies buried on the premises. At the time that this happened, Aldolfo, as well as some other high-ranking members of his cult, were in Mexico City on business. Aldolfo got word that the police had raided his compound, so he thought the police would be showing up any second. Completely unbeknownst to Aldolfo, in the motel he was staying in at the time, there was a domestic dispute happening a couple of rooms down. The police were called to answer that domestic dispute, however when the police pulled up, Aldolfo assumed that they were there for him, 
so he broke out of the motel room with machine guns and started a gunfight with the police. So there is a total chance Aldolfo could have gotten away for God knows how long if he wasn't so paranoid he just shot at the first cop car he saw. During the shootout, Aldolfo realizing he couldn't get away, ordered one of his workers to kill him as well as the other high-ranking members, to which he did in the motel, on May the 6th of 1989. Because of this, it can never be confirmed exactly how many people he killed. The confirmed number between the bodies that were found on the premises is 23, between all the human body parts and everything. However, considering he was doing this for years before he owned the compound, and the fact they probably dumped them other places, some believe that the number of people Aldolfo killed or had killed is quite possibly in the hundreds. Charles Starkweather was born on November the 24th of of 1938 in Lincoln, Nebraska. He was born into a working class family and was bullied at a young age due to a speech impediment he had. Whenever he hit high school and took his first eye test, he figured out that he had very poor eyesight. As a matter of fact, he couldn't read the letter at the top of the eye chart. However, those around him just assumed that he was a slow learner and he was also bullied for that. As a response to this, Charles began to bulk up at a young age and eventually began bullying those who used to bully him. When he was a teenager, he watched the movie Rebel Without a Cause, starring James Dean, and became so obsessed with it that he began dressing like James Dean and self-identifying as his character from that movie. He dropped out of high school at the age of 16 and two years later met a girl by the name of Carol Ann Fugit who he quickly developed an interest in. Carol also claimed to be in love with Charles. I should mention she was 13 at the time and uh, probably was not the best judge of character. One day Charles was teaching Carol how to drive his car when Carol crashed it. Charles' father who owned the car was furious and kicked Charles out. At this point, Charles became much more violent and headstrong. At the time, he was working as a garbage man, but said that he was going to quit it and just begin a life of bank robbery. The first killing took place in 1957 when Charles was only 19 years old. He was at a gas station when he tried to buy a stuffed animal dog for Carol. However, he didn't have enough money and the owner of the station said he couldn't buy it on credit. Charles came back later that night at three in the morning with a shotgun and robbed the gas station. He then forced the attendee who refused to sell him the stuffed animal to walk out into his car and then at gunpoint, Charles made him drive into the outskirts of town, get out of the car and Charles murdered him. He told Carol about the robbery. However, according to Carol, he never said that he murdered the gas station owner. However, the killing spree would begin in 1958. One day, Charles drove to Carol's house with a rifle and box of ammunition. Now, the details of what happened next specifically are very foggy, as both Charles and Carol have changed their story multiple times on it, sometimes saying Carol was already there when Charles arrived, sometimes saying Carol pulled up in the middle of the process. However, what is known is that whatever events occurred, Charles murdered every member of Carol's family. This included Carol's parents as well as her two-year-old baby sister. He then hid the bodies at the back of the property and put a sign up in the front of the house that said sick with flu. Charles and Carol then lived in the now vacant building for about a week. And I'm going to go ahead and address this now because it kind of changes the way you view the story. It is heavily contested if Carol was an accomplice in these crimes or a victim. Because again, she was much, much older than Charles. At this time, Charles was 19 or 20 and she was 14 or 15. According to Carol's eventual court story, when she got there, Charles had already murdered her parents. However, Charles told her that he was holding them hostage and if she didn't do what he said, he was going to kill them. On the flip side of that, Charles attested and there was some evidence to kind of hint to the fact that Carol wanted Charles to murder her parents so that she could have more freedom and then was part of this joyride they were about to go on. Honestly, after reviewing all the information, I can't really tell either way. I can say that whatever case, she was probably manipulated heavily by Charles, but I don't know if she was like held at gunpoint or she was doing the holding at gunpoint. Either way, for six days, they stayed in this empty house until Carol's grandmother came over to check up on the family. When Charles answered the door and said no one's home, she got suspicious and alerted the police, but by the time the police got there, the two were gone. As a matter of fact, they had ran to the next farm over and killed the owner there and stole his vehicle. 
From here on out, vocally, I'm just going to say that Charles was the one doing the killing. However, keep in mind, it could also be Charles and Carol. While driving that night, they got the vehicle stuck in the mud before two local teenagers pulled up and offered to give the two a ride. At some point, Charles had them pull over and murdered both of the teenagers. The two then went to a more rich area of Lincoln before breaking into a large house. They broke into the house of a wealthy businessman who, at the time, the only people who were home was his wife and the maid. Charles killed the wife and then forced the maid to make Charles and Carol breakfast. And then whenever the husband came home, they killed him before killing the maid as well. They then stole the car that the husband had pulled up in and made their way into the outskirts of the city. At this point, the killings were pretty high profile, so much so that the governor of Nebraska activated the National Guard to look for whoever these rampage killers were. While driving, Charles and Carol heard about this development on the radio, and Charles decided they needed a car that wasn't so high profile. There was a traveling salesman who was asleep in his vehicle, which was parked on the side of the road on the outskirts of Lincoln. So Charles pulled up behind him and then murdered him before trying to steal his car. However, the salesman's vehicle had a parking brake on, which Charles didn't know how to work. So as he was sitting there trying to start the engine, he couldn't get the vehicle to move forward. A random passerby saw this happening and pulled off in order to help whoever it was having engine troubles, to which Charles pulled a gun on him. During a shouting match with him pointing the gun and the other guy saying he just wants to help, a cop drove by who recognized the vehicle as being the stolen vehicle from the murder house and realized this is the guy they're looking for. The cop turned around on the road to which when he did, Carol got out of the vehicle and ran up to the cop car and said something to the effect of, it's Charles, he's going to kill me. Now this moment was heavily contested in court because the two arguments were A, either she was legitimately trying to get away and she saw this as her opportunity to get away, or B, she was doing this because she figured they've been made and it would look better in court if she tried to get away. Either way, Charles jumped back in the original stolen car and began a high-speed chase reaching speeds of up to 100 miles an hour around the back roads of Lincoln, Nebraska. The chase went on for so long and got so intense that the police who joined in began leaning out the window shooting at the vehicle. Eventually, one of the gunshots hit the glass and a piece of glass flew through the air and cut Charles along his neck. Charles thought that he had been fatally wounded, so he stopped the vehicle in order to get medical attention, when in actuality it was just like, maybe a centimeter deep cut. And then during the trial, as I said, Charles said that Carol was a willing accomplice in the entire thing, and Carol said she was a victim. That thing that I've mentioned earlier in this iceberg, like, you know, back in the 50s and times beforehand, they didn't really care how many people you killed because one kill equaled one death penalty. Well, that's exactly what happened. Despite having 11 counted murders, he was only convicted of one and given the death penalty. At the time, it was found that Carol was complicit and a part of the murders, and she was given a life sentence. However, she only served 17 years of it. Charles had no final words at his execution. However, in a final letter that he wrote to his dad, he said, I'm not real sorry, we had real fun. And Charles was executed by the electric chair on June the 25th of 1959. This is weird. So the next entry in here is Bevan Spencer Von Eyman. Uh, he was an Australian serial killer. And I, like I did all the notes and the research for him. However, uh, I understand why he's at the bottom of the iceberg. Uh, the reason for it is because the manner in which he killed children is so brutal that I, I get why he's down here, right? Um, but everyone kind of hyper-focused on that online, and there's not a ton of research or information, at least I found super readily available, about him growing up or whatever, and it kind of just became a show of like, wow, isn't this brutal? Like what he did to these children? And you know what? Uh, I'm not going to cover it. I don't want to cover it, especially because like, with what I found, if I was to do this, it'd just be like, and he killed some kids, and that'd be the end of it. Uh, but I don't like this guy, and it's my channel, and I do what I want, and I'm not going to talk about it. So, as a sort of, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, what's the word for treaty? As, as a truce, there we go. As a truce between me and you, because I'm taking another name out of this. I was considering doing another serial killer video that is a bit, a slightly bit more lighthearted, 
and that being serial killers from history, like Vlad the Impaler, and whatever the name is of that Turkish guy who killed like a hundred people, and things like that, like historical serial killers. So I'm going to go ahead and put myself on the stand, since I'm taking another name off this list, and say that I will definitely, in the near future, do a video about famous serial killers from history, so be looking forward to that. But yeah, I just don't want to talk about this guy, so moving on. Tony Costa, also known as the Cape Cod Vampire, was born on August the 2nd of 1944. He was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and his father died in World War II while Tony was only an infant. However, when Tony was seven years old, he said that he began seeing a man who he identified as his father from pictures that his mother had, and said that he would come into his bedroom at night. So while this is in itself alarming, it was doubly alarming when, as Tony got older, he began exhibiting signs of sociopathy, particularly a lack of interest in care in family members or colleagues. In 1961, when he was only 16 years old, he broke into a girl's apartment and just stood over her bed. She screamed, called the police, he got away, and then three days later, he came back and tried to drag her down into her own basement. However, neighbors heard her screams, came in and helped, and Tony was arrested. In 1962, he was convicted of this, and only did a short stint in prison for breaking and entering, most likely due to his age, and after he got out, he married and had three kids, and his life seemed to be going well until he developed a drug habit. Although, while it's not entirely sure when the murders began, it's believed by most that they began in 1966, when two girls asked for him to give them a ride up to Pennsylvania, and and they were never seen again. It was around this time that his marriage was falling apart, mostly due to his lack of care due to the aforementioned sociopathy, but also he was a heavy drug user and began going in and out of jobs. To the point where, in 1968, he moved out to California for several months and began dating a woman there. However, that woman disappeared and women around him began disappearing. This began a cycle in which he would begin to see a woman or come into their proximity for a while, and then they just up and vanish. Also during this time, he broke into a doctor's office and stole about $5,000 worth of pharmaceuticals. And Tony managed to stay relatively below the radar until two girls who had told friends that they were going out with Tony up and vanished. The police began a search of the area they were last seen and found one of the ladies' bodies buried in a local cemetery. That started an entire search of the area until a mile and a half away they found what Tony had been doing with the bodies. The bodies were cut up and seemingly being used as fertilizer for a drug garden that Tony had put together. It's believed by many that this wasn't just a means of covering up evidence, and that Tony believed there was some spiritual purpose to consuming drugs that were fueled by human remains. From there, Tony was arrested, however, he maintained a story that he was only the accomplice in a larger killing committed by someone named Carl. There was no evidence of a Carl ever existing, and Tony changed his story several times around this, so it was generally believed to just be a falsehood. And Tony was given four life sentences, one for each of the murders. While in prison, Tony wrote a book titled Resurrection that was a story of how this crazed killer named Carl committed all of these murders, and Tony was just a helpless bystander. Going as far as to say the people that he did definitively murder because the evidence for it was too strong were actually done as mercy killings so that he could free them from Carl's torture. However, this story didn't really take, and the next year in 1974, while in his cell, he unalived exit gamed himself yeah now this was my last entry or the entry that i added to the end and it may not seem as over the top as some of the previous ones to you i mean that one guy was hunting people in the middle of alaska the reason i included this is because if you know this case then you know a lot of the rumors surrounding it according to the district attorney and something that was never corroborated or proven it was claimed that all of the bodies found had their hearts missing, the blood drained, and bite marks all over them. This is what got Tony the nickname of the Cape Cod Vampire, because it was believed by several that he was drinking their blood and using their organs for ritualistic purposes. And that the bodies found being used as fertilizer for these drug plants were just another means of that. After the research I've done, I believe he probably murdered eight people. However, a lot of people like to say that he murdered exactly six. 
six being the number of the devil, and the idea that this entire thing was some large ritual killing. So much so that people say that this Carl character he made up was either a possession or the devil himself forcing him to go about this, leading several people to believe that perhaps Tony Costa was a possessed serial killer. Or a vampire. Pick your poison. Tsutomu Miyazaki was born on August the 21st of 1962 in Japan. Miyazaki was born prematurely, so much so that his hands were still fused together and his entire life he was unable to spread them apart or bend them upwards at the wrist. He was born into a very wealthy family, however he had very distant parents who were more focused on their business lives rather than his well-being. Furthermore, Miyazaki was heavily bullied at school due to his deformity and throughout his childhood was very quiet and reserved. For a long time he was a straight-A student until high school whenever he began to drop off in schooling dramatically. He had moved out of his house for high school and after doing poorly in high school, he moved back in with his parents and had to live in his sister's bedroom. It was during this time that he considered um, the console shutoff thing. However, his grandfather, the only positive influence in his life according to him, talked him out of it. During this time, he was constantly depressed and felt that no one in his house cared about him. This became all the worse when in 1988, Miyazaki's grandfather died. To which members of Miyazaki's family found him eating his grandfather's ashes. It was around this time that he said he was being actively ostracized by his family, for obvious reasons. However, things really came to a head when one day his sister caught him spying on her while she was in the shower, and whenever she said something to him, he attacked her. His mom was rightfully angry and began yelling at him, to which he began to physically beat his mom as well. Shortly thereafter, one day after his 26th birthday, Miyazaki was driving through the city when he saw a little girl playing by herself. He said that he felt relatable to her as both of them were people alone, so he decided to lure her into his car. He then drove out of town and sat in the back seat with her, parked in the car simply talking for 30 minutes before Miyazaki killed her. He left her body there in the woods and every day for the next several weeks, he would drive out into the middle of the woods and just sit next to the body. One day, for whatever reason, he took off the hands and feet and decided to keep them in his house. While I couldn't find language confirming it, I believe at this time he was renting a small apartment apart from his family since he was kicked out for the whole attacking his mom and sister thing. After this, every time he traveled back to the body, he would bring pieces of it back home with him. Eventually, he cremated the bones and sent the cremations to the young girl's family, along with a note saying that this was in fact their daughter's bones and that they should have them tested to prove it. Not long after this, he committed a second murder in much the same manner, continuing to go back and retrieve pieces of the body afterwards. In his third murder, he did the killing in much the same way. However, for an unknown reason, he dumped the body in an empty parking lot. After the fourth murder, again conducted in the same way, he brought the body home and began to drink its blood. At one point, he cut the body into pieces and scattered them around the city, but then became nervous afterwards and seemingly from not wanting to be away from the body parts or fearing that they may be discovered, he went around and recollected them all. All these murders occurred between 1988 to 1989. During this entire time, he would cut out words from local newspapers and send them to the families of the children he murdered, terrorizing them. In several of these messages, he would detail what their daughter smelled like after she died, as well as give gruesome details about what he did with parts of the body. The murder spree finally came to an end whenever Miyazaki was trying to get his fifth victim. He saw a very young girl and her slightly older sister playing in a park and separated the younger sister from the older one. The older sister had got weird vibes from this man, so she went and told her dad. Whenever her dad came to find this weird man, he found that Miyazaki had made her undress herself and was taking pictures of her in the back of his car. The dad, rightfully so, tried to beat him to death. <laughs> And while nearly crippling Miyazaki, Miyazaki managed to fight back enough that he ran away. However, Miyazaki, in an act of unbridled genius, 
came back to get his car that same day, which, you know, at that point, the dad had called in the entirety of the Japanese police force. So whenever he showed up, they just arrested him. Upon searching his house, they found 5,673 VHS tapes. The majority of them were standard anime and Japanese television. However, several of them were illicit pornographic materials, and some of them were even recordings he took of the bodies after he had killed them. This started a moral panic in the media around Japan, and Miyazaki was given the nickname of the Otaku Killer. From everything that I read, this was like a one-to-one -one comparison of whenever there's like a school shooting in the U.S. and they blame video games somehow. It was along that same line, only this time it was anime. During the trial, Miyazaki said that an entity known as Ratman forced him to kill the children. More specifically, he said that Ratman had always been his companion and by his side, and after his grandfather's death, had told him that the only way to feel better would be through murdering the young girls. There was such a huge debate over whether Miyazaki was in sound mind or not, that the trial went on for seven years. During this time, three entirely different psychiatric teams came forward to determine if Miyazaki was of sound mind. The conclusion that they seem to have came to is that he definitely isn't of sound mind, but he's close enough that we can kill him. Essentially saying that he understood right from wrong and was smart enough to make sure he didn't get caught. At least, you know, before he walked back to the car in the middle of a police investigation. In a lot of the interviews he had around the time of the trial, he said that his murdering of the children was an act of benevolence. And finally, on June 17th of 2008, Miyazaki was hanged in Japan for the murders of four children. And on that, we have the ending of the serial killer iceberg. And I know a lot of that was depressing, especially there at the ending with all of the gruesome details of it. However, I want to make clear, and I've talked about this in the past, but I mean it now, you clicked on this video and you're looking at, I can definitively say now that we're at the bottom of the iceberg, you're looking at the worst of the worst, like as bad as it gets. And while I'm glad that you came to this little rabbit hole to go on this expedition with me, I want to emphasize that we're just in a rabbit hole. And the world is so much bigger than everything that I've talked about. This isn't even a fraction of a percentage of what the world is like. This is the bottom of the bottom of the pit. And again, I've said this before, it's fun to go down the rabbit hole, but you've got to pull your head of it, out of it every now and then to recognize that it's just a rabbit hole. And uh, the world is a fantastic place full of beautiful people who do such beautiful things with acts of kindness and goodness. And maybe I'll talk about them someday, just not today. Um, but I know one beautiful act of kindness that is being done right now, and that is you all supporting me by watching this video and allowing me to fulfill my dreams of talking about weird stuff on the internet full time. And it's entirely thanks to you all. So from the bottom of my heart, let me say, Thank you for watching. For real, thank you all so much for watching all of that. It really does mean the world. Hopefully you guys enjoy what's coming next. Uh, last things to mention, once again, the U2's vinyl figure and mug, link in the description below if you're interested. Uh, but that should do it for now. Like I said, new content on the way. Stay tuned for that. So that should do it, but I just want to say thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed, and I will see you in the next one. Fuck!